Dark save for light being cast from the big TV screen and the imminent sunrise that's teasing the one starry sky with whispers of morning. Hey, Mike. Hey. So it's uh, it's you. It's that not George yeah. person. Glad to still be here, like I am always. I assume since the last time you guessed it, you've just been sitting in that chair. Playing every conceivable game, waiting for one to line up. Well, the way I like to see it is I've been on every episode. I just haven't had any comments on <laughs> almost all of them. That's right. If you open up the Logic Project, you would see that there is a totally silent track for Mike on every show. That's like that's a weird like um uh like oh there's an empty chair at the meeting table for to represent the customer or like ever <laughs> since you know great great auntie died like we still set a place for her at the table like i'm going to i'm going to start doing that you're going to get an empty track it's uh, the Clint Eastwood RNC appearance thing from years ago. <laughs> oh god i forgot all about that was it obama was he supposed to be yelling at obama uh, i don't i don't think anyone knows for sure what was happening <laughs> he clint eastwood probably does not know for sure <laughs> Yeah, we um we got together to play uh, a little Final Fantasy Tactics. So uh, two yes. two points of order. Um, George is not on this episode uh, because him and I uh, talked about playing Final Fantasy Tactics, and he said um, he felt that he would just spend the entire episode uh, praising uh, the character Algus for his enlightened worldview about uh, highborns <laughs> versus peasants. And how an mm-hmm. entire class of people should be subjugated uh, by the noble elite, and uh, and I agreed with him that that would not make super interesting radio, and uh, so he he bowed this one out. Which I mean, if you stay after the end credits for the the Marvel after scene, that is actually the end message of Final Fantasy Tactics. <laughs> people of, need to know their place. That's true, it kind <laughs> of is. Um, yeah, and then the other thing is, uh, so there's a 1998 game, um, which is, uh, I, I mentioned this on one of our other episodes, this is now at least late enough in the 90s that I was like, yeah, I remember this being toward the end of the 90s. I yeah. really hate the middle of the 90s because I can't remember anything about those dates so when i looked this up and i saw 98 i was like yeah that feels about right well i think part of the confusion is sega released like 16 consoles in the middle of the 90s so (laughs) like you don't have those clear (laughs) yeah what was it there was the there was the master the original master system then the genesis then the 32x a sega cd it was jack jaguar wasn't them that was atari that was atari right okay yeah sega cd um, and then uh, I feel like they had the that giant crazy octagon controller thing. Was that a 32x thing? <laughs> you remember what I'm talking about? I think that was for the Genesis, so you could sort of do fighting games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was their uh, take on the that nin- that rubber Nintendo pad that you were supposed <laughs> to run on, but every kid just got down on their knees and just yeah. dropped on it as hard <laughs> as they could. Everyone. <laughs> ah, um. But so, yeah, tell me, uh, Mike, what your nostalgia goggles for Final Fantasy Tactics is like. And and I, I need to be clear. Sorry. Um, uh, we played the actual original PlayStation 1 version of this uh, because yeah. there's a remake called War of the Lions, which fixed some of the things we're going to talk about later and broke a bunch of other things. Yeah. Miraculously. And then they tried to release this for uh, Android and iOS. Uh, which it plays at normal speed and it has all the modern translations and things, but the controls are just untenable. It's really not fun on yeah. touch screens. Yeah. So um, we played the original and we're talking about the original. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, this was the era when Square, you know, very famously had just switched to Sony and was not making games for Nintendo, which, you know, in my 90s, like, fanboy world was like a big deal but uh (laughs) they also were on a system with cd-roms that you know provided you like 650 megabytes and i I actually looked up the biggest n64 cartridges ever got was for resident evil 2's port and conquer the 64 megabytes is the largest cart that ever happened so literally a tenth at the best case scenario. <laughs> and most 64 games were, you know, as small as four or eight megabytes. So, <laughs> Which, I mean, and on the one hand, it's like, 
wow, that's amazing what they accomplished with so little space. But then it's like, yeah, but CDs had been invented by this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the PlayStation exists only because Nintendo basically pissed off Sony. But yeah, um, that, they're weird. Like, oh, we're going to plug a CD thing on to the cartridge. Just kidding. We're not doing any of that. Now we created a competitor. So, uh, I mean, this game comes from, a, a, you know, Square hired on the Tactics Ogre guy to come and make a Tactics game, and that's exactly what he did. And, uh, you know, we got this game, and we're fresh off of Final Fantasy VII, which is full-on, like, uh, you know, emotional fantasy, like a huge event for PlayStation. And this is a little something different, and I remember being interested, but kind of very, very confused by this game, because as we'll get <laughs> into it, it's... It's not shy about being a complex game. You know, there's a lot of information that you can use to your advantage. And if you're not aware of it, then you're just kind of swinging in ignorance. <laughs> so did, did you, had you played Tactics Ogre before you played this? No. And subsequently, when I've gone to try to play through Tactics Ogre games, they have never hooked me as much yeah, as this th game. <laughs> this was my exact experience is this was my first Tactics style like strategy strategy rpg i guess um and i'm not totally sure what the genre for this is <laughs> I, now that i think about it but this was my first of this type of game and then uh brian who i've mentioned a bajillion few times now he had tactics ogre but i somehow just never played it and so he was like oh you love final fantasy tactics you should try tactics ogre and i remember getting literally 10 minutes into it and just being like yeah but it's not final fantasy tactics <laughs> and then when the sequels it's not coke <laughs> pretty much right and then when the the sequels uh to final fantasy tactics came out on the game boy advance i was like yes finally oh god it's not final fantasy tactics <laughs> at all like <laughs> snowballs in a schoolyard this isn't gonna work for me <laughs> well and the judge system and all these other weird yeah. it, it's like it, they just had to bolt on a bunch of extra nonsense and i was like no i i literally do maybe just want more of the same. I'm not going to say I definitely want more of the same because that would give away whether or not I thought this held up. So I'm going to be all oh, mysterious. No. <laughs> You've really left us wondering. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, I, I will say this is one of the games uh, like a Mega Man X, a Super Mario World uh, that my nostalgia goggles are a little bit skewed for because I never stopped playing this game. Like I started yeah. playing it in 1998 and I have revisited it probably every 12 to 18 months ever <laughs> since. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's not like, Oh, I remember only what this was like when I was, you know, 15. It's like, I also remember what it was like when I was 25 and 30. <laughs> yeah. So you've either, you like seeing through your dark nostalgia goggles or you've, don't, they aren't very shaded, and it's actually just a decent game. We'll find out. Uh, I, I, I'm <laughs> going to enjoy this conversation because, you know, even though I've played through the game probably at least 10 times, um, knowing I'm going to have a conversation about the game mechanics, I still looked at it a different way, and I think we'll get into some things that, you know, when you're just playing for fun, you don't necessarily think about. Yeah, and that's uh, that is definitely a for better or worse quality. There have been some games that I was like, this game is perfect. And then we started chewing on it. And I was like, it is almost perfect. <laughs> like, And then there's other things that, you know, I was like, oh, well, now I understand why the developers might have done that. I still hate this piece of garbage. But, you know, so th it's like it, it's a it's you know what it is. It's a compressor. Like it brings down some of the highs and brings up some of the lows and you just get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's uh, let's start with visuals then. Um you 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 mentioned uh not uh limited to four megs so <laughs> the, there's some striking visual distinctions between this and some of the its um contemporaries yeah well i mean in the mainline final fantasy games on playstation square pushed straight into like the highest production value they probably could do at the time and this game with you know the exception of some of the cinematics does not try to do that it's not trying to push full polygonal. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say at first glance, you know, you're like, oh, they're like 16-bit style sprites. But once you get into the game a little bit, there is actually a richness to the animation and the number of poses to each character that I think leaps a little, even though it's sprite-based art, leaps beyond what most 16-bit games ever got to uh, with how many different ways the characters can move and interact. Well, in the... The variety of animations 
allowed them to do something that until this era wasn't even like a question, right? So all eight and sixteen bit era games that I that I can think of, they all did their cutscenes as they were, like in engine, because where else would you do them, right? Yeah. And then when they made the leap to disc-based games and they were like, oh, we can pre-render a bunch of nonsense and shove that onto the disc. And then when you get to this part of the game, it'll just play it, right? There was even like a little name for it. They were FMVs, full yeah. motion video, right? And I actually really appreciate now in hindsight, like I, I liked it at the time because I was like, wow, these sprite graphics are amazing. But what I didn't recognize then, and I now have all of the following history to compare it to, all of the future <laughs> history, um, <laughs> is uh, they do all of the cutscenes in engine. Like every time two people are talking to each other, every time you steal one of the, the Zodiac stones, every time Delita betrays everyone he interacts with, <laughs> like that's all done in engine, which means there's just tons and tons and tons of custom sprite animations, a lot of which are literally only used once. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, at the very end... Um, the the blonde lady who secretly works for the church but was also kind of working for Delita, like she comes and lays flowers on the grave. Like that never happens any other time in the game. Yeah. And that character is only in like three scenes. So they had to develop a bunch of custom animations for a character who's barely ever on screen. And and it it makes them not just feel really good then, but like to me, it has given them incredible longevity. Like when I turned this on, I was like, yes, this looks exactly as good as it did in my memory. Yeah. And like they didn't just like take the generic, like in the battles that you swing a sword and you hit someone like in this, in the cutscenes, they didn't just blindly take that same animation and go like, oh, let's just use that thing again. Like <laughs> if people are dueling, they actually move in a way they don't move in the normal game that it, yeah, it looks you know, a little bit more story. cinematic. Yeah. And so, like, dodging a blow and then stabbing a guy, like, it's just really satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> Not it's, that the in-game battle animations, they're also satisfying, but it's just different. It's different, and it's more, it's more like reminding you that there are active game mechanics happening. But even some of the more advanced, because you, you have, like, and we'll get to all this in mechanics, but, like, you have uh, abilities you can set up that respond to, like, incoming attacks, and one of them is Blade Catch, which I think only the villains have. Or can you learn that from Samurai? Uh, I think either the thief or one of the ninja can catch, can learn catch. Yeah, it might be thief. It, some somebody can learn to like interrupt a sword attack, basically. And it it has it doesn't just hold up the shield like when you block with the shield, and it doesn't do the little dodge animation. Like there's actually a bespoke little sword catching yeah. animation because it's different. So it deserves to have a different animation. And I think part of the reason that's significant is uh, if they had gone to 3d graphics, like the other final fantasies had, and like all the N64 games did. Um, and I mean, just most games of this era, right? Where wooshy wooshy 3d, then you would expect a lot more variety in the animations because it's done through rigging, right? Like we designed this character and now we're going to have, we're going to rig them up and then we puppeteer them around. So you mm -hmm. expect a lot of custom animations because it's like you do all this upfront work so that the custom animations are easier to do when you need them with sprite work. If there is one single time that a character does something, they do it no other time in the game and it needs to be viewed from six angles. Then they have to draw that sprite at all of those angles and that's the only time that work will ever be viewed by the player. Like that's yeah. And and I don't think you need to know that all of that work goes in it. It's kind of like when you watch like a cheap. I'm gonna rip on DreamWorks. When you watch like a DreamWorks movie and you're like, yeah, th this looks good. I mean, like the graphics are high quality, but everything just feels kind of lifeless. And then you go back and you watch like an old Disney animated movie where everything was hand drawn and you have no idea how much work it truly, truly is, but you can just feel the quality like seeping through. Right. Or when you watch like a Miyazaki Unless you pause movie. them at the wrong time. Well, yeah. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> the in-betweeners. Don't look at those. You could probably pause a Miyazaki movie at any moment and be like, wow, every single blade of and grass. It belongs was in a, you, you hear Indiana Jones go, it belongs in a museum. <laughs> no matter when you pause. it. <laughs> yeah. So maybe Miyazaki is a better comparison. Cause like it's, just all so lovingly crafted and you you just feel it right and that's i mean i'm a huge fan of pixel art like i make no secret of that but i'm really glad that this game looks the way it does because it 
didn't just look great at the time. It's aged impeccably. It is a fine wine of pixel art. Yeah. There are, nonetheless, some some rough edges to some of the visuals. Um, so the environments are polygonal with, you know, texture maps. And I think for the most part, there's some really cool details to them, too, for the era. You've got, you know, animated water. There's, like, some lighting and some shadow stuff that's sort of faked in a pretty convincing way for the aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I like looking at all that. And, you know, we'll get into with mechanics, but the visuals have to convey so much information in this game. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of success, but there's obviously some problems. Um, but so we have flat sprites uh, in a 3D world. So we have sort of the billboarding you guys have mentioned in some of your other episodes. Especially and, at rotation time, which happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. And there's a, kind of the sense that, like, the sprite struggles, struggles, looks really weird, and then switches finally <laughs> to the next pose. And as you rotate around, it's pretty pretty awkward looking sometimes. <laughs> Well, and ironically, it's the worst in cutscenes because during gameplay, you can only rotate a full 90 degrees. And so it moves you, pretty fast, too. Yeah, and it, it's pretty zippy. And if you hold down the rotate, what is it, L1 and R1? If you hold down the rotate, it spins, but it spins at full speed the entire time, right? So the the characters are all doing that like snap of the billboard where they're like, oh, got to correct the direction I'm facing. Um, but that's, you know, like there's a bunch of stuff going on. You're in the middle of combat. You may, you may overlook it. I mean, I generally overlook it, but a lot of the battles start or end with some conversation. And a lot of those have like a slow, what you would think of as like a helicopter shot or like a, like a drone yeah. shot where it, it pans in a way that you as the player can never make the camera pan. And that's when you really see like <laughs> yeah. facing the wrong way, facing the wrong. <laughs> and it's like they, uh, it, it's like they suddenly realize that they are two D in a three dimensional world. And there might even be a little bit of me that feels it like it's an ASMR thing, where like when it snaps, you're just like, oh, finally. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's the it's the release of tension that is actually. Yeah. Like with without the 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 tension, there could be no release. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's really strange that they're just their idle animation is they're walking in place, like they're on a treadmill. Uh, I'm not sure that's really necessary to know they're alive <laughs> that they have to be walking. <laughs> it it does feel like a a weird design choice because then, like when you're hasted, you march twice as fast. But when you're stopped, then you stand perfectly still, right? And you you don't do the idle yeah. animation. But there are other ways they could have conveyed hasted yeah, and like stopped. Yeah, there's like the classic fighting game, like breathing, like would have sufficed, and you could have still accelerated or frozen that for the same communication. Yeah, or or they could have uh, the characters could be completely static, like chest pieces, and then. Um, like colors, right? Like when you're poisoned, you're green. And there's like a few status ailments that put like a little box like over your head with a little, you know, status indicator in it. Yeah. But but there's a lot of colors in the rainbow. Like they could have given you a whole bunch of symbols and colors that float over the character's head. I'm glad they do some kind of movement, like bre breathing, like fighting, fighting guy, breathing, Ryu and Ken facing off probably would have been an acceptable choice or, or at least a good choice, if not even a better one. But if they were stationary all the time, it would suck a lot of the life out of the game. Then it, then it would feel yeah, like chess. that's true. It's just no one walks in place in real life, so it's just a strange <laughs> look. Yeah, it's not... Um, it, it's a it's very Rick and Morty like don't think about it like you just you need to just be like oh look everyone's alive because yeah. they're real people in a battle in a field I've shattered that glass for anyone who plays this game now but uh, <laughs> uh, another thing that you look for in RPGs is how fast does the text move and it's blessedly <laughs> fast by default and when you press the button it you know it fills the box instantly so if you don't want to wait for it to typewriter it out very ex important except between chapters <laughs> and for some reason it's like someone writing those annoying dramatic tweets with punctuation between every it's just like one at a time so i i work with uh a woman in my office who specializes in accessibility technologies like screen readers and things and uh it makes me think about some of the things i see in that light and when <laughs> 
I because I I haven't replayed this game since I met her and and started learning about this stuff. And I think that is how a screen reader reads what visually it looks like a very cleverly written tweet, right? When you put like a, a non-breaking space emoji in between your characters to like space the letters out so that a person will hear it in their mind in a specific way, you're not really considering what that's going to be like for a screen reader. I think this is a, a blind person who uses a screen reader getting back at sighted people. Cause like, <laughs> this is what it feels like assholes. Like this is how we feel all the time. The word takes five minutes to crawl across the screen and it's arduous. And even though after like the fourth letter, you could probably guess what the word is. We're going to make you sit through it. Yeah. Uh, I did I... notice uh, one thing that I absolutely remember from the first time I played this game right up through every subsequent play. Um, can you do anything but stare at Ramza's butt in Chapter 4 when he's got, <laughs> got the blue armor, but then the silver greaves, and so his butt is silver and everything else is blue, and you're almost <laughs> never in an environment where anything is silver, so his butt just <laughs> sticks out at you. It's like a baboon. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> constant like i recognize that when i was a little kid and i i every single playthrough when i get to chapter four i'm like ah, i'm almost at the end of the game there's old silver butt now <laughs> i don't think i have noticed that but now i will forever <laughs> you're very very welcome <laughs> so uh, the uh the particle effects are one other thing that i wanted to mention uh particularly because you you addressed like texture mapping on the 3d effects you uh, you have a unique uh, critique on audio and video, uh, being that you do those things in your life outside of this podcast. <laughs> um, so you probably know a lot more about it than I do. When you see an effect in this game, like uh, the magic where there's like sparks flying off, you know, like a lightning strike and then sparks fly away, um, or when someone uses the 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 brave stone, the Zodiac stones to like turn into a monster. And there's all like whooshy whooshy ghosts and stuff. Yeah. To me, that all looks like it's either all pixel art or mostly pixel art. And, and with supplemented with like some 3d texture mapping, but it all looks really hand drawn. Like, and or I think that's in pre rendered. Because, like, like, yeah, but, but it, I'm sure it was tempting to say, oh, well, we'll just mathematically define sparking, right? And then when the lightning strikes, there will be sparking math done. But I think if they'd done that with particle effects in a 3D engine, it would have felt really out of place. Like like lightning was striking in front of a 2D picture, right? It would remind yeah. you that the sprites are all two-dimensional, but I never felt that way. All of the, the wooshy wooshy effects still feel spritey, pixely. Yeah. Well, and I, I noticed that they tend to, you know, they kind of like dim the theater lights when you're casting magic and they kind of, um, it kind of takes over the entire presentation, which feels really powerful. Like when you cast holy on someone for the first time, it's <laughs> like, you're, you're like, holy. Sh <laughs> <laughs> holy <Wow>. is right. <laughs> And, you know, some of those spells, they like the, if you have good headphones in or like you have your TV turned up, like they're, they're, they boom and, and we're not in sound yet, but just like it, <laughs> it feels really nice. And the, the magic and, you know, one of the pitfalls of especially this era of RPGs is they, they unlocked a new entire tier of graphical capabilities. And as we know, like in Final Fantasy VII, when you summon the monsters, like, <laughs> and it's, I think eight might be the worst of all on this. Like, you're like in for like the same cinema, like every time you cast it, and it's just like takes forever. And tactics doesn't usually err on that side. Um, no, when they're, you summon, they're, the summons have a little animation, but it's relatively short. I mean, especially compared to the other Final Fantasies, it's like the blink of an eye compared to Knights of the Round. Yeah, maybe 10 seconds, which, you know, if you're in a hurry, is still kind of annoying, but it's nowhere near the level of annoyance as in the mainline games. You you do not play Final Fantasy Tactics if you're in a hurry. This is not, <laughs> this is not a I have five That's minutes true. before I have to leave the house game. Uh but yeah, no, I agree that the they didn't go polygonal with the spells. Uh, they they definitely embraced the. Um, I don't know if pixel art is exactly the right term because it still feels like they 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 leaned on their CG team to basically blend in 
probably, you know, computer animation that is then pre-rendered and then kind of composited on top of it. But Yeah, maybe it has to do with uh, rendering it as a flat image as opposed to something you can tell has depth. Yeah, the sparks don't pop around the battlefield or bounce or right. Like yeah, anything you, you like don't that. feel like oh, they're coming right at me. It's it's a layer that's blended on top. It it doesn't interact with the graphics. Yeah, I like that you mentioned the house lights too because uh, there's an interesting, possibly intentional, but maybe just happy coincidence thing that happens where. Uh, like a summon, because summons can affect like a huge part of the screen, right? And they're visually huge. They're really cinematic compared to even the more sophisticated spells. Like the summons, there's, you know, character flies in and they don't move. They're like a static, they're like a stamp, yeah. right? And then like, boom, and all this stuff happens. And you can tell based on which characters are still fully illuminated, who is about to get their balls <laughs> rocked. <laughs> and like, it actually builds some tension because you have just enough time to be like, oh God, is that character's faith really high? Are they about to take like 800 damage and drop in one hit? Or is their faith super low and they're just going to shrug this off and then like march over and stab that guy in the face? And so there's this this like interesting bit of like, these are the people who are about to get screwed that you get <laughs> yeah. because the lights go down for everything else. And you're bleeding straight into graphic serving gameplay because that, that's communicating to you who's getting hit. <laughs> so should we just move straight into that? that zone? We, Do you have we, anything else? Uh, no, I, I think this is a good place to, to kind of... And, and the, these, you know, these things, they, they, they intermingle a little bit. Um, but other than, uh, other than a few of the weird choices like oh, we put a ledge over here and then there's a bunch of the battlefield on the other side, but no camera angle quite serves that spot of the field. That's I was going to bring up that the, <laughs> the isometric view ha- contributes some problems to the game. And the f- very first one is they designed so many of these maps to have blind spots where it just feels like you can't quite see what's happening. And when enemy units cast a spell and it kind of shows you where they're going to hit with that spell, you got one shot to see that information. <laughs> yes. you, can, you can look up when they're going to hit, but you can't... I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe there is a way, but I would never found a way to to like re-look up exactly which tiles is that Black Mage about to hit. Yeah, um, that's actually... So I, I, I was going to get to this later, and we can dig in on, on this a little bit more in mechanics, but like... I never really exploited that ability, right? Which is arguably core to the game design, like that you have near perfect information and then you behave accordingly. Um, yeah. But I don't know if that's actually something you can reference later. That might be like, oh, you missed it. The camera happened to be in this crazy <laughs> orientation. I'm like, I missed it. You missed it. <laughs> Yeah, and so, I mean, just right off the bat uh, for this section, the, the game is so information-dense, and it, um, you know, once you actually learn that density, it does present a lot of it in a pretty efficient way of, like, looking up, all right, who's an enemy, where am I, who's doing what, where, but, man, to get there, the game does not help you much, and I don't want to get to mechanics just yet, but, <laughs> you know, th- this game has to tell you about statistics, health, magic, um, height, elevation, different kinds of terrain, there's turn orders, there's charge times, there's, uh, I mean, there's just so much <laughs> to convey, and so, you know, uh, part of me is just impressed that I'm not just completely, like, it's not just a full-on crazy tabletop game where it's just, like, you have to kind of spend your life learning the system before you can get in but at the same time it is just there's a lot going on and the the camera angle doesn't always help so much um i'm trying to see what else um don't don't you think the the camera angle is it's never useless but the usefulness of it can spike like way up where you you're on a a a a battle a a field like you're in an area that's just pretty much flat and uniform like the desert right and you're like oh i can see everything i know where everything's going on i can tell how far away everything is and then some of them are like very hilly or there's like a small like ravine in between two areas and like i like to have the camera tilted up most of the time yeah same (laughs) but then there are certain maps where it's like having the camera tilted up makes this map unplayable 
because it's not straight top down. It's like, do you want to be looking from like a 20 degree angle or 40 degree angle? Right. And the 40 degree angle I think is preferable most of the time, but every once in a while, I'm just like, I I know there's somebody over there doing something, but I can't, I can't go and get a beat on them. It's like the the surface before they got the kickstand that could bend a lot more. It's like, well, I can sort of type, <laughs> but not really at this angle. Um, and the, it has the other like thing that plagues every single. So this game came out either before Dual Shock controllers were a thing, or even if they were out, um, the game didn't support them, and so you had to use the D pad, and so isometric mapping the d-pad you're always like is up gonna go northwest (laughs) or northeast and there's there's just no way to know till you just memorize it like muscle memory (laughs) because yeah i this so this is one of those things that i uh know is deep in my muscle memory because when i talk to someone who's never played games from this era And then they get their hands on the controller and they're like, how am I supposed to know which direction up is? I'm like, well, it's just, it's obvious if you've done this thousands and thousands of times. (laughs) Yeah. So that's, that's a little annoying. Um, the, so you mentioned like changing the camera angle and like some of the maps have story elements. So like you get your camera dialed in and then it's like Ramza wants to talk (laughs) and therefore who cares about your camera preferences? (laughs) We're resetting them. (laughs) Yeah, and and it's uh, because I always have the camera in that that higher orientation. That's a great signifier that conversation is about to happen because the first <laughs> thing it does is drop the camera and then it rotates. <laughs> so every time I'm like, why did the camera just go back down? Oh, some <laughs> morons got something to say about the church abusing the war or something. <laughs> yeah. um, I I think it's a little weird that you can't spin the camera unless you it's your turn and you're in control or someone's in the middle of moving, you can spin it. But if they're like choosing to do something, it's like, nope, locked out. Can't change the camera angle right now. Yeah. There are a few times when the computer would do something and they, for all intents and purposes are giving you a, what they think is the best view on what's happening right at that moment. And 90% of the time, I would say the view they gave me is fine. And I probably would just be spinning the camera, like waiting for my turn. (laughs) So the fact that I can't spin it isn't that big of a deal. But every once in a while, it's almost like the game puts you behind a rock or something. (laughs) And they're like, yeah, you can't see what we're about to do. Who knows what we just did with our turn? I feel like what it actually does is it spins to the nearest thing. It's that meets some minimum criteria. Like you can see this much of the, like the height difference between the tile, the sprite is on and the thing that would be in its way is this much and no more. And then it just stops. Even if there might be a better angle, it's like found one done. (laughs) You're, You're probably right. Because I mean, to just, to be sit there to sit there and just rotating the camera aimlessly while <laughs> other things are happening like you can't even really do that as the player like no. you can rotate the camera when you're trying to like select a spot to move to or to like which square you're going to put your attack on but while characters are moving while things are happening you cannot just arbitrarily free spin the camera even on your turn so yeah. They might have done that for like processing reasons where they were like, while stuff's moving around the screen, we don't want the camera just flying in circles. Um, or it, it could have just been a way to like slow down focus. And they're like, no, no, it's not a free camera game. That's not what's happening. Like you have a certain angle on the battlefield and that's that's the angle you have. Yeah. I will say in defense of uh, the graphics, because you're just so negative. Um <laughs> There are, like, in terms of how they they serve gameplay, um, I really appreciate that, uh, except face characters never change the way they look, um, but any regular uh, party member on your side or the enemy side, you can tell what job they have by just looking at them. I should say, you can tell what their primary job is, because later, people get into all sorts of weird combinations, the the bad guys included. They pull out some crazy combinations, and you're like, whoa, like, I didn't know that that, you know, person could do that thing. Um, And the bad guys, (laughs) uh, other than some, you know, palette swapping on the colors, the bad guys' classes look the same as when you are that class, which is when they introduce a new class that you don't yet have, 
it's a, that's how the game introduces a lot of the game mechanics. It doesn't really like hold your hand, but it's like fight one of these. Don't you wish you had one of those? And yeah. and so it's Here's nice that that matches hat. up. What can he do? <laughs> yeah. And so it is, you know, in a game with so much information to convey, the fact that they did make, you know, other than Ramza or the, some of the other special characters, um, that th- they communicate the classes so clearly by outfit is so welcome. Because if I had to go and click on an enemy every single time I wanted to know what class they were, I just wouldn't do it. And then I just wouldn't have that information for the battles. <laughs> and so it's, it's really nice to just be able to glance and see, that's a mage, there's a knight, okay. Yeah. And the... I wouldn't say that there's as much utility in the fact that uh, weapons actually look different. So, like, if you are if you have a gray sword, it looks gray. But if you have, like, a magic blue sword, it looks magic and blue. And it's not just color swapping. Like, this one has a blade that's really wide at the bottom and then tapers. And this one looks like a katana. And this one looks like whatever. And, like, every weapon actually looks different in hand. And there's a pretty yeah. big variety. There's... There's daggers and there's swords and there's big swords and there's Asian swords and there's uh, guns and there's axes and maces and bows and like all kinds of nonsense. And every single unique weapon actually looks unique when it's used in the battle. And generally speaking, that doesn't convey much useful information, but I do think that graphics that make the game world feel more alive and immersive like that, that does serve the experience in a, I think a really important way because otherwise you're like, well, I'm just playing Stratego, right? And I'm just moving yeah. in inanimate representations around the board. Whereas this feels like, no, I'm actually, I am these people and I'm commanding, you know, my fellow soldiers around this battle that is actually happening that I'm witnessing. Um, the world map. So uh, <laughs> this is this is a good thing. You know, there no, might I be did, some bad I, things too. <laughs> the world map is like so inoffensive and unspectacular. I'm just I'm kind of like, what good or bad things are there to say? Yeah, I mean the the main thing is the functionality is you know it's color coded in very clear ways that you know green places you might have to fight in, blue places are safe, and some of them you can shop in. And if you want to advance the story, go to the red. And they make that really clear because when a story thing happens, it's like Indiana Jones line red, Indiana Jones line <laughs> it red. It totally like... does the little little plane <laughs> overlay. They do that in every single movie. <laughs> I feel like they do. <laughs> if not, they I should go back and change them. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. It's a pretty unspectacular map. This is not like other RPG maps where you're actually on the ma- I mean, you do have a little character, but you don't move around the map the way you do like in an, another Final Fantasy game. It's very much like it's more like your the, destination. And yeah, it's, then, more, it's more like the Super Mario Brothers 3 style of map. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, you can zoom out on it <laughs> and see like really, really bad pixelated like yeah. scaled what what must they have cut that that mechanic was serving and then, and then they left that in for some reason right it's like if you built a telescope but you didn't put glass lenses in it and it's like well now you just have a useless tube and it's like but you can still look through it but it doesn't do anything you just want to see the world with a circular crop <laughs> This is the way people who design avatars on websites see things all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess, you know, one other thing about the battle, you know, and really they put all the work and in, including the cutscenes existing inside the main battle environment engine, all the detail they poured into the game really is for that place where you spend the vast majority of your time. Um, I do, you know, have a line here, uh, flat earthers rejoice because the edge of the battlefield is just a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't even, they don't even pretend that the world continues beyond it, which I mean, I get from a, you know, let's just not bother them with t- things that look like tiles, but you can't actually go there. But at the same time, and it's just kind of weird to be floating in space like the movie Dark City, if I spoil the <laughs> ending. <laughs> well, and, and a couple times, all right, so... We just played through this, so I'm, I'm, I think I might be right when I make this sweeping generalization. But correct me, because you'll only need one data point for me to be wrong. <laughs> uh, in some of the cutscenes, or in some of the cinematic ways a battle starts, um, characters enter the battlefield, and I don't think you ever see someone walk onto the map. 
it just makes that weird rumbly (laughs) walking noise. And then the camera pans and now people are there who were not there before. But I can think of a lot of times you see people exit the map and they do get about half of a step off the edge of the world and then their sprite, you know, becomes transparent yeah, like and they fades out. fade yeah. into obscurity. And there, there's a handful of times in indoor environments where you see people go through doors. So their sprite does fade into obscurity, but you can't really tell because they're almost immediately obscured by a wall. But on any of the outside maps where people would be just floating in from the ether, I don't I don't <laughs> think I can't think of a time you ever see someone just appear from out of nowhere, right? It's they always tastefully appear when the camera was not looking at where they approached from. Yeah. I I think I I might be wrong about that, but it if it's not 100% of the time, it skews really heavily in favor of let's not just show people pop out of the, the gray cloud that is the rest of yeah. the universe. Uh, this this is what your brain is focused on, and it's ignoring the rest of the universe right now. It, it's Yeah, it's it's the magic trick, right? Like, keep all of your attention right here while I steal your watch. Yeah. And I mean, if anything, that helps the gameplay because you're just not distracted. But, you know, sometimes in the cities, you know, to... To see a larger city might be kind of cool because some of the places are implied to be kind of big places. Oh, yeah. In, really in interior environments, it totally makes sense because there are actually just walls that usually go off the top or side edge of the screen. So you feel a sense of closeness. But in fields and deserts and things and, and even cityscapes where a lot of the action happens, especially for the first like two thirds of the game. It's, I would say, mostly outdoors. Um, yeah, I mean, you're just floating in space, and it does make it feel a little bit more like a game board, and some of the big spells yeah. zoom way out, and the whole map spins around, and you're just like, Whoa, right? So it's, <laughs> it's very flat earth tabletop board gamey, but mm-hmm. it, it's, it always came across to me as like a, a visual design choice that forces you to focus, like you said, not as a... I don't think it was a limitation. I don't think it was something they they like felt bad about. They were like, no, we're just, this is the map, and we're not going to yeah. show you other things besides the map. And anywhere the light touches, you can go. <laughs> yes, that's very true. There are hardly ever tiles that you can't stand on, and the ones you can't, it's obvious because it's like garbage or like a pointy rock or something. Yeah. So the, you can, basically, if there is a tile on the screen, you can go there, which is kind of nice because... If there was arbitrary nonsense in the background, you might get like a Mario Invisible Walls vibe where you're like, can I go over there? Can I not? Like, is that background? Is it not? And that's not ever, ever having to make that distinction is pretty sweet. I do have uh, one other comment that you made me think about the world map that's actually not in my notes. So good job inspiring new (laughs) thoughts. Um, to really reinforce how much of the action takes place in like the battle engine, uh, there are bars, shops, fur traders, and the recruiting center. What the, what is that place called? <laughs> the place where you recruit your soldiers. <laughs> soldiers, except, except for shop, I pretty much interact with none of those. When yeah, I play me the either. Game <laughs> but, and we'll we'll get to all that, but. Um, <laughs> I, what I was going to say is in all of those, it is a static uh, drawing in the background that's mm-hmm. like heavily desaturated and then menus that float in front of it. So when you go into the bar, there's like static picture of a bar and then there's here's what you can talk to people about in the bar. When you go into the shop, yeah. it's a static picture of you in the shop and then it's like here's what you can buy in the shop. It's like shopping in front of a nice Renaissance painting. <laughs> <laughs> it basically <laughs> is. But I mean, it's like even there where it might have made sense to just show some generic animations of like the main character, like walking around the inside of a shop while you float through the menus. They were like, Nope, the menus are going to take up 98% of the screen. And the 2% you can see is going to be a matte painting. And who cares? It's the shop. Go fight another 20 minute battle. (laughs) And actually we have a lot of information to convey in the shop. So be glad we did this. Yeah, it would almost be annoying if they gave you tiny little text boxes and then we're like, oh, look at this cool little animation in the background. It's like, no, just just give me the information. That's why I'm here. Yeah, like you ever you ever find like a utility app on your computer that won't let you resize the window bigger than it decided to be and you're just like, I hate you forever. <laughs> <It's kinda> like, <laughs> 
Let um, me decide how big you are. Yeah, I think the only other big visual thing on me is that, you know, we'll get into it again more with mechanics, but um, very, very nicely clear when you're selecting a tile to move to or which tiles you can move to or when you're casting a spell, you know, it, it it's not subtle. It's not just like a dotted line or something. It like totally changes the color of the tiles um, to indicate that. And that's, you know, it pops right off the screen, which is good. Yeah, it's some of those little gamey mechanics where it's like obviously the characters don't see blue and green and red tiles all over the place but we do it's like yeah no please err on the side of me knowing what the hell is going on over like oh but that's not how they would see the world like no i i need this information it's a strategy game um i will say uh earlier you had a fantastic uh, what would have been segue into audio if we <laughs> if we hadn't had more things to say. Um, so I, I'm going to revisit that with a comment that I have from my notes, uh, which is you mentioned like how spectacular some of the magic sounds. Uh, and I actually really appreciate uh, not just all of the, the sparky, sparky boom magic effects, um, but the uh, like death noise, like the like, Argh! right? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's a little, if a whole bunch of people die in quick succession, you realize it's the same sound effect for everyone, and that takes you out of it a little bit. Wilhelm scream of the game. Yes. Uh, But I mentioned that the the effect when the, you know, all the asshole people turn into the Zodiacs, like, visually is really satisfying. I really like the (laughs) noise that that makes, and that's unique just to those bosses. So it's like, not only is it a, kind of a cool sound effect but it, it's unique so you only hear it like what eight eight or nine times or something in the whole game or i guess 12 if you go fight the bonus bosses but it's a it's a it's cool sound effect that they could have probably ginned it up a lot more but they kept the audio fidelity about on par with the visual fidelity it's like hey here's really high res pixel art but they didn't try and give you a fully voiced game because yeah. they're like oh we can put mp3 or wave wave files we can put wave files on the cd they were like no it's gonna be all text boxes but every once in a while there's gonna be a human sounding noise and it's gonna like be really striking and it's gonna stand out yeah so there's our segue <laughs> <laughs> uh well let's let's talk about music first and i mean this is one of the few one of the earliest final fantasy games that i'm gonna totally butcher the pronunciation of his name but uematsu did not do the music to this game it was a different composer it was two Um, it was two and the reason i know that is because uh i love this music so much and i actually went out and bought the soundtrack which i don't know why i didn't do that like years and years ago um but as i was importing that into my uh my library so i could get to it from all my devices um i noticed i was like oh there are actually like two different people who are like the primary credit on different songs um but yeah it's not not uh, i'm also gonna butcher it it's not that guy U- umatsu. <laughs> the bu- umatsu. <laughs> yeah um who is really good I mean, his, you know, yeah. his work is really, really He's highly like regarded. A John for Williams reason. of game composing. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, but th- these two composers, who I'm not even going to make an attempt because I, I can't. They're, they're, they're Japanese composers. They have Japanese names. Um, yeah. But this music is like some of my all time favorite Final Fantasy music. And it's. Oh, man, it's just so good. It's so good. It's so good. And. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's uh, it's different than most Final Fantasy music. It's it's more like, I don't know, I mentioned John Williams a second ago, but like it's more like war music, more... It's, I mean, not that, not that other Final Fantasy music isn't orchestral, but this is, this is very much like you need a symphony orchestra to play this. It's not like, you know, a lot of the other Final Fantasy, especially in the PS era, started adding like electric guitars and like cool, <laughs> weird, like mixtures of things, which is really cool in its own way. But to match the, you know, the high medieval fantasy of this game, which is very, you know, it's very, it's not as much of like a personal heroic story. It's way more political landscape and, you know, intrigue and betrayals and like large scale society, like, oh, the church is corrupt and these different warring, you know, it's like Game of Thrones, but Final Fantasy. And so the music is appropriately more something that fits that kind of genre, I feel. 
Well, and I, I don't know. Again, you're a musician, so tell me if this makes like no damn sense <laughs> what I'm about to to posit to you. But I feel like the the music conveys a lot of emotion. Like you're never asking yourself, what is the emotion of this scene right now? Like, how am I, the viewer, supposed to be feeling as I watch this guy stab that guy who a minute ago thought he was his buddy, right? Like, <laughs> th- there's a lot of, I right now I should feel excited, and right now I should feel sad, and right now I should be scared. And it's all done in a way that feels, like, period appropriate, right? Because the the electric guitars are a good example. Like electric guitars to modern ears, right? Like anyone born after probably the 1950s or 60s. Your elect- kids are going to love it. <laughs> yes. Like electric guitars mean something very specific, right? Especially when it's like, you know, all distorted and like driving and fast. Like you know how you're supposed to feel when you hear that because it's been used as background music and so many different things. And, and the, the way people tend to perform when they're playing that kind of music. And yet... If you become aware that you are watching sword fighting and knights and magic and witchcraft and wizardry and you are hearing electric guitars, it can be disorienting because then you're like, oh, okay, like I get that they wanted me to feel the way electric guitars make me feel, but could they not have done that with an instrument that wouldn't have stood out quite so much? <laughs> and and I feel like they accomplished that throughout tactics is – you know exactly how you're supposed to feel at any time. Sometimes things feel like kind of uh, like floaty and magic-y and otherworldly because there's a lot of, especially in the, the chap- fourth chapter, there's a lot of suddenly like, ah, there's all this magic in the world nobody knew about. Yeah. <laughs> but but they never go to like the theremin, right? <laughs> they, they, never, yeah. they never pull something out that you're like, I don't believe that there's somebody in this universe who could be playing this instrument. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the game world does not have high technology like the PlayStation Final Fantasy main series does. The the closest it gets is very decidedly steampunk, like the machinery that's in the game. And and, and even that, they very hand wavy say like, oh, it's all powered by magic. Like like yeah. they're they're machines, but they, they don't have like electricity as their power source. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and there's there's dams and you know very very physical you know like the the simplest like yeah, there's gears. a windmill yeah <laughs> and like the like you know we have eight polygons so let's make this windmill <laughs> 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 have two gears that spin <laughs> yeah um, but it, it it all like I mean it, is that does that seem on base to you like that using instruments that are also like period appropriate helps create a sense of continuity between the audio and the visuals or or am I just making crap up? No, it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I think what's incredible to me about the soundtrack is there are Final Fantasy mainline games that are pretty much entirely medieval fantasy. And this still feels distinct from those. And in a way that, you know, very literally, this is Ivalice or Ivalice or however they say it. Um, It's, it's, (laughs) It's a different, consistent kingdom that's been revisited in a few other games like Vagrant Story and Final Fantasy Twelve, and there might be a couple other games. But um, it's it's its own distinct universe that gets used in a few different Final Fantasy contexts, and they they created a music aesthetic that fits it, and it's it's nice. Yeah, and I, I I'm trying to remember what the music in Final Fantasy Twelve was like because I know it is set in technically the same world further into I, the future or something um I, i'd want to revisit again to know for sure but I, I played it a year or two ago when they put it out on ps4 mm. until the f- four times speed mode ruined it for me because i didn't want to <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to play normal speed anymore but um i feel like it is very similar um and i i like the idea of because i mean the, the fun of tactics is so all about, you know, what you said, like the church is corrupt and political intrigue. And, you know, this guy thinks he's working with that guy, but actually he's working with this other guy. And it's not because he's betraying him. It's because the first guy misunderstood and they were actually never friends. Like there's a <laughs> lot of it. I mean, it is very Game of Thronesy with distinctly less boobs and butts, but uh, you want less HBO. <laughs> that's right. You, you want the uh, that kind of militaristic you know a lot of snare drum a lot of horns a lot of strings like it's not just symphonic 
for the sake of being like big and bombastic. Like it's even the slow songs that play behind the really slow text crawl feels like the music that would be in the background of a scene where there's a bunch of generals around a table and they're trying to decide like what their next move is like, Oh wait, that's exactly the music they use in all those scenes where there's a bunch yeah. of guys sitting around a table trying to decide what their next move is. Cause that's like, it, it's the slow thinking, planning, plotting. And yeah. then there's like the fast, like, you know, more exciting music when like magic and nonsense is happening. Well, and even though it's not a space opera, I, I do feel a connection <laughs> to like John Williams, star Wars kind of like, they they'll go to a throne room and the music does not just stop when like the scene changes. It just like kind of seamlessly dies down to something creepy or you know to like. There's always kind of a bed that carries through seamlessly through. And if this was an episode of Flipping Tables, I believe uh, <laughs> Final Fantasy Tactics. It's not a space opera. <laughs> would have to be the title of this episode. Uh, how about sound effects? These are great. Really good sound effects in this game. <laughs> That sounded really pedantic, but <laughs> you are right. They are really great. And uh, something I noticed that is one of those things you're not supposed to notice, but because we're critiquing the game, I, I made a point to think about a little bit is there's like a billion different kinds of things that make unique noises because it's a world with magic. So you have all of the normal things like stabbing a guy or punching a guy or trying to stab at a guy but missing him, right? And then you have like you hit him but it bounced off their armor or their shield or they caught the blade or whatever. And so you have all of like the things in the physical world that would make noise plus a billion made up things that someone has to also make up a sound effect for. Yeah. Nobody knows what Titan coming up out of the earth and then punching everyone with his giant <laughs> Titan fists should sound like so somebody had to you know sound design all of that and they are very and generous it turns out it's a theremin is what that sounds <laughs> like <laughs> but they're, they're very generous with the audio is not necessary to convey virtually anything that i could think of I'm I'm pretty sure that you could play this game on full mute and never be like, oh, crap, I have no idea what just happened, right? Um, when somebody dies, there's a visual change. When a spell is cast, there's a visual change. When you take damage, there's a visual change. Yeah. Like, you know things, but the sound supports all of those visuals. And so they could have kind of phoned it in and been like, oh, there's a magic noise there's a getting hurt noise. There's a healing noise. But I mean, God, even the three different kinds of potions each have a different sparkly potion noise, <laughs> right? So like the one that heals you the least has like the smaller sparkle. Yeah. And then the X potion has like a bigger sparkly noise. And like, I just really appreciated that like bolt one is like bank. And then bolt <laughs> yeah. three is like, kaboom. And like, it's a, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's satisfying to feel the, the audio impact of the differences between those things. There isn't just a mm -hmm. fire noise. There's fire one noise, fire two noise, fire three noise, and then there's a flare noise. There's actually a fire four. Like, this is one of the oh, few Final yes, Fantasies that goes to four. It goes to four. Um, <laughs> and you, you might think that they might, you know, they're giving themselves uh, more range to cover to convey that one is different than two and three and four, but they totally nail it that when you launch fire four, it's just like, if you, if you I don't know if you invested it in your black mages this time that long because <laughs> it's it's like eight or nine hundred skill points to get it but it, it job job points sir <laughs> right right i'm thinking of deus ex um <laughs> but yeah the, the sound effects and you know we you know now that i'm in video work i get to say in my industry um <laughs> we people people don't usually think about the sound unless there's a problem with it but it does a lot of heavy lifting on how you feel about what you're doing and when you land a hit or when they block your hit you f you feel so like oh <laughs> i knew i shouldn't have tried to hit him face on i should have moved around like you're just like no <laughs> yeah no it's it, like i said it's it's i don't think there's anywhere in the game where the sound conveys or any of the audio conveys something that isn't also conveyed arguably better by the visuals but the visuals all the colors would feel desaturated without the audio, right? The The music is tremendous, and I, I love this music to death, but the every every pixel that was lovingly placed, there's also a note 
or a, a digital sound effect that was equally lovingly placed so that it sounds you know as scary as it should or as triumphant as it should uh when somebody dies like i said it's there's a guy dying noise a girl dying noise and then i think like a handful of monster noises there aren't as many noises as there are monsters but there are like several monster noises but when something dies especially the the human men and women and and it's like (gasps) the wilhelm scream i'm not gonna do it it's like the wilhelm (laughs) scream right it's it's upsetting like you (laughs) feel bad that a human life was just lost even if it's someone you were trying to kill except when it's algus when you kill him and he makes that scream you're like yes and it's tied really well with like a dramatic flop onto the ground like (laughs) they they collapse when they die right but i mean imagine playing it with the game on full mute if you saw that you'd be like oh i guess i got him but when you hear a (laughs) blood curdling scream you're like oh he's oh my god he's dead like you just want to play the text version of the game where just a console message <laughs> just reports that a death occurred. You killed <laughs> With passive Algus. voice. You don't even know. T- Twenty. <laughs> Algus was killed. Twenty-two job <laughs> <Yeah>. points. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, one other thing I wanted to comment about the music specifically. Uh, it, it's it's earwormy in a way that is doesn't like make me want to kill myself because this game has a pretty high amount of grinding required. You cannot just play the story missions unless you drag every story mission out, like (laughs) just unacceptably long. You have to do some choose your own adventure grinding where like, do I want to fight on this map or that map? Do I want to walk between these two cities or those two cities? Right. (laughs) Yeah. So the fact that I enjoy the music as much as I do, even when, the thing I'm doing in battle is in no way engrossing. Like, okay, we've pinned the monster in a corner. The other four of us are going to stand over here and throw rocks at each other for 20 minutes focus, because focus, I really want to focus, focus, focus. <laughs> I really want to unlock auto potion, right? Like, or fire four, right? Like the fact that the music can stay compelling, even when the player is hyper aware that they are just playing a video game and all, uh, all immersion has been broken. Um, that to me is a real, that's a huge thumbs up to like, this is quality music. You will even enjoy listening to it when it's not supporting what's going on and you're just doing nonsense. Yeah. Um, let me see here. Oh, uh, there are times like with, um, uh, Spell-like abilities, I guess, would be the D&D way to describe it. Because if you cast a spell on an empty uh, set of squares or tiles, um, the spell doesn't go off, right? Yeah. But there are some spell-like abilities that hit randomly within an area, which means those abilities can hit empty tiles because you have to let it play out and see whether or not it's going to randomly hit a tile that has a character in it. And, uh, that is one of the only times that the audio and the visuals are kind of out of sync with each other because you hear the noise of magic just happened, but because there's only a visual when damage is taken, unless you die, um, then you hear the scary sound without knowing whether or not you took damage. So like if you looked away from the screen while one of those spell like abilities was going off, you would not be able to tell if you got hit during that time because damage is conveyed only through, you know, the number popping up over your head. So that kind of made me wonder like, should there be an audio cue for damage or would that be overwhelming? Cause you'd be hearing it constantly (laughs) or, um, does this actually by uh, you not knowing if you took damage, if you blinked at the wrong time or if you took your eyes off screen or something, does it actually add to the tension of the randomness, right? Like this is the audio being used in a way that's unique, right? You're going to hear the spell effect, whether or not you took damage. And if you were looking over here to grab your ice cold, refreshing Coca-Cola beverage, then (laughs) you might not even know if you got hit. And that, that creates a little bit of extra tension. So I couldn't decide like, did they flub this by not making it more clear in the audio whether or not it hit you or is you not knowing part of what makes it 
scary and random. Do you remember which? I remember the Heaven and Hell Night kind of stuff. Like it would still show you even if it wasn't hitting someone. It would just like exactly show the visual. There, there's also the... some monster abilities that, um, like the Hydras and the like, the three headed dragons. Like they they just hit in a in a cross, you know. So some of them will go off on empty spaces. Um, gotcha. But yeah, the, those kinds of of spell like abilities, right? They they hit empty squares. What do you think? <laughs> Tension or lost opportunity for a really repetitive damage noise? Uh, yeah, I probably don't want a noise that unnecessary noise added. So I'm, I'm probably just just got to live with it, I guess. <laughs> so th- then we'll say it was done on purpose to create amazing tension. <laughs> uh, controls we we've kind of hit on this already some, but uh, we can do an actual deep dive. Um, so, I mean, the, we have the aforementioned isometric world problems on where is <laughs> up going to send me. Um, which uh, Instead I of don't... first world problems, that is now what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm going to say isometric world problems <laughs> and just wait for someone to be like, what? <laughs> um, that one is, you know, you get over it pretty quick in the game. It's, it's, it's annoying, but yeah, you get your muscle memory grows instantly because you're moving tiles. That is the game is moving across tiles to do things. <laughs> and so, um, you know, if, if they were inconsistent about it, that would be a problem. It's like, well, you turn the camera and up always goes northeast, no matter which camera angle. Like that would have been a horrible design choice, which they avoided. So, yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah, if it was it's, like it's one Resident of those things... Evil tank controls or something. <laughs> It, it's one of those things that I only feel like I notice when I think about it. Like, if I'm just playing, I would never be like, oh, man, I don't know which direction the arrows are going to go in. Because, you, like you said, you just built in that muscle memory. And then if someone said, like, oh, this is a weird camera angle. What happens if you push up right now? Then you're like, I am suddenly less confident in how to answer that right <laughs> so it's it's the minute your attention gets called to it then you're like eh. but it's as long as you're moving about you know in down in your your brain stem instead of up in your forebrain then it's <laughs> yeah. then it's totally fine so it's you know i mean it, it's a design restriction of isometric well and like when there's limitations to a design you can you can kind of evaluate if it's actually harming the gameplay by the context it's in and so almost any time you're doing something in this isometric world there's a confirmation stage and that totally saves any error you made moving around is like no i meant to swing this way not that way the game gives you a moment to go you mean this square that's the (laughs) one you want to hit and that you know, if that little catch didn't exist before, you know, like you're deleting all your files on your computer, like <laughs> <laughs> since that thing catches you, then you don't get as angry about it because you're like, whatever, I'll fix it. I'll move over there now. Yeah. And it's it's interesting that you should mention that because uh, in my notes for mechanics, because these two sections are combined so we can fluidly move between them <laughs> in my in my notes for mechanics. um the one time that that confirmation step I feel like is too final is when you move. If you say, yeah. I want to move from point A to point B, and then you have not yet taken an action, you cannot go back to point A and move somewhere else. And the place that that is something I guess you just have to learn, like this is the way to deal with it, is... Like, I want to use a spell-like ability. Here is the area that it affects. How many squares in front of me does it work on? Okay, let me open the action menu, select that <laughs> yeah. spell, look at, count how many spaces away from me I can use this spell, and then count how many spaces from the furthest I can walk to the enemy to see if I can hit them with the spell, right? So, like, because you can't, undo a movement step before you take an action step you kind of fall into this weird additional planning stage where experimentation is not a thing you can do which maybe maybe that is an intentional design choice where they're like no once you move you've moved now you're over there well there are some game features i think did make that a design choice which is move find is an ability you get and so would you just be able to try every square on the map and see if you found anything 
and undo it if you didn't? Or would they just wait till the end of your turn to check your square? Mm. Um, or there's like but, going to the treasure chest or trying to get an ability from a crystal. And could you just be like, oh, I didn't get what I wanted. So undo. Yeah. No, that's an interesting question because all of that stuff would have to shift to the end of your turn if you could undo a move before you took an action. And I don't know that I would like that because (laughs) what you do on your turn can sometimes be influenced by those things that happen after a movement, which can be feel super triumphant. Like if you are, if there's an enemy near a crystal and you're almost dead or you're out of MP and you go stand on that crystal and get your MP back and then summon Titan to end the world, like that feels super triumphant and that couldn't happen if you didn't get your MP back or you didn't get the treasure or you didn't get your stolen yeah. ability from a corpse soul or whatever <laughs> those crystals are. Like that couldn't happen if all that happened at the end of the turn. You'd have to like wait, which would make it feel less It'd be clunkier. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah, I think I might actually have to agree with you. Not being able to take back your move may be the right way to go. Well, I mean, it definitely is frustrating when you're like, ah, I didn't move close enough, or I moved too close. He's going to get to me, and I shouldn't have. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, but I I think overall this is the right way to go, given some of the other mechanics. Maybe if there wasn't anything like that that could happen after a move action where, like, move HP up, move get item, move whatever, then maybe I'd want to be able to undo my move, but because moving can have an action like impact in the game world if there's entropy to it in the game so it's just Ooh, like you there's, moved there's entropy to it that's <laughs> that's heavy dog um, i mean <laughs> they could have made it so that even though you found out that thing you can still undo it and just decided to let you but i'd also feel burdened if i was in that like collector mode of move find item i would just be going to every square and i don't want the burden of knowing i could do that yeah no (laughs) george has uh often said like players will optimize the fun out of a game (laughs) so if that was a thing you could do if you could just make ramza check every single square you would and eventually you would find all the hidden items and you would have no fun doing it I feel like I'm that way in stealth games where I, I will sneak, you know, I'll be the sneak archer in <laughs> Skyrim and therefore I will crawl through the game. And, you know, when I play like Metal Gear, they kind of like, they often take that away from you and said, no, you got to get moving, buddy. <laughs> but it's, to me, this is more like if you are playing the sneak archer and you don't sneak perfectly, do you then reset the game or do you deal with the consequences <laughs> of your failure? Uh, in those games, I reset. Cause I'm just like, no. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So maybe you'd be fine with it, but I feel like a lot of people, they would be giving into their cow clicker monkey brain. Yeah. Where they're like, oh, I'm just going to check every square. Cause then I won't miss any items. Yeah. And, and like, no where other do you part draw of the brain. line? Like, oh, I missed them. Can I undo my hit and try it again? <laughs> like, I mean, that's what save states with this game would do that where you'd be like, ah, I don't want to do that now. And, Oh my God, I can't imagine trying to be like, okay, I I only have like a 4% chance of this incredibly insane (laughs) thing happening. I'm just going to say save states would be exactly what we're describing. It would allow you to optim because you have nearly perfect information. So you're like, I have a 4% chance. So at most, I only have to statistically load my game 20 times and or 22 well, times find, and you'd find out quick you'd find out quickly if the game had a seed set in place or if it's actually generating a new seed every time you try the thing oh that's the true this yes yeah, <laughs> it might it's not be true baked in. <laughs> St- it's not real like physics of the universe statistics so it could just totally give you the middle finger and be like no we decided ages ago you were gonna miss <laughs> it's the the end of uh watchmen <laughs> 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 that I really hope that's not the case though because that makes every failure and every triumph in Final Fantasy Tactics feel way less earned. Right? It's it's like the Sim City where you know you picked the number for the map at the very beginning like when you created Ramza at the beginning. Yeah. No, I'm going to decide that that's not the case cuz it's going to make the game feel less cool. Head cannon. Um, um is there any other specific controls thing you did mention to me in our chat the uh the circle X thing which was another oh. one of those things that once you brought it to my attention, I was like, God damn it, Mike. Like, cause now I'm thinking about it. 
Yeah, because the the convention on PlayStation generally is that X is accept and Circle is cancel, or sometimes Triangle is cancel. Um, yeah, no, but e- no. either, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> um, but the Super Nintendo convention was that B was cancel, which was in the place where X is, and A was accept, which is where Circle is on the PlayStation controller. And uh, so Square was still holding to that. And, you know, since the original PlayStation controller was essentially a Super Nintendo controller with extra shoulder buttons. Um, <laughs> That's true. It, uh, they, you know, they probably had a dilemma there of like the platform convention is this, but our games and fans of our games are probably used to this. And so they're, they're kind of in a transition mode, I think, in this game. You know, it's just, it's not a problem. Like, it, just like the isometric controls, you get used to it really quickly. Um, I don't think the game lets you change them, but I don't think it's really a big deal. I Maybe if I'd grown up as a PC gamer or if I played a lot of fighting games, I would give a crap about changing controls. But every time someone's like, oh, yeah, I map this to that and that to this other thing, and I have a stomp pedal <laughs> for this command, and... Then I flip the table over to make this other thing happen. I'm like, why? Why didn't you just use the buttons you were presented with? Like you go to your friend's house with Super Metroid and play on their save, and you're like, what did you do to the controls? <laughs> yes, exactly. L like that. sprints? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that kind of thing just... I don't know. Maybe Maybe it's just a quirk of the way I play games, but I really feel like a lot of research tends to go into the defaults. And in a game like this... If you accidentally confused accept and cancel, you would build the muscle memory of it being reverse in this game really fast because otherwise it would make the game unplayable. Because every like the whole game is canceling and accepting things. <laughs> so. I mean, do you want to do this? Yes or no? Like <laughs> it's yeah. And technically, even if you only learned except I think you could still play the game because most of them actually give you a visible menu. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, do you want to do this? Yes or no. And if you hit cancel, even while the cursor is on, yes, it still backs you out. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it wouldn't back you all the way out. So you'd still be stuck casting your spell until you eventually figured out the cancel. But at least, (laughs) at least you you can sit in that limbo for a while and think about your life. (laughs) Who who am I really? <laughs> who who even is Ramsey? Um, I mean, I think the the menus are very satisfyingly fast and responsive in the game. It, you know, you can kind of zip around your options, and I, I can't really think of you know other than the chapter text being unskippable. <laughs> um, you know, when text bubbles pop up or when you're navigating through and picking spells, it's all you know it pops up very quickly and uh, satisfyingly fast. So let, let's talk about some of the like battle. Battle, right? Because as we said, right, the majority of the game is you fighting, right? It's yeah. not, it's not like the random encounters in a Final Fantasy where the majority of the game is the story. Like this, the majority of the game is playing the game, and then yeah. the story is conveyed like kind of in between big, big fight sequences, right? So, uh, a lot of the design choices they made uh, either have a chance to shine or be incredibly annoying and frustrating constantly. And one of the design choices they made that I I personally think is a full on mistake is uh, when you go to the the orange red spots on the map that you mentioned are always indicating a story battle. Those are the only kinds of battles that are sometimes multi tiered, and in between each battle they allow you to have the option to save your game. And what they don't tell you is oh by the way. You cannot exit this sequence of fights once you yeah. start it. So if you get to the second or third fight of a you know, three, four length fight sequence and you can't win, you just cannot beat that last fight, you're stuck. Your save file is now done. You are trapped forever. You can't buy more potions. Any armor that got stolen or broken, you can't replace unless you carried extras into that castle. And... uh you know, sometimes even like it'll you'll go to a place and it'll just be a story moment. And you're like, cool, I'm ready to stroll out, and the game is just like, aha, battle. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, it, it there's at least three or so, maybe more times that happens in the game, and it seems really proud of it, like, aha, we got gotcha. you. <laughs> and I, I don't think it really adds much to the game besides potential frustration <laughs> that if you saved on that spot before trying to move, you might be stuck there. Yeah, and and it does feel like it. There's a a thing I think about a lot, which is like 
parts of a game that feel video gamey where like I as the player am aware in a very visceral way. Like I am playing a video game right now and I am thinking about a design choice that they made and whether or not I like it. And you could make a really good argument that I, I would have a hard time disagreeing with that's yeah, before you just blindly move away from an area, you know, to be safe, you have to make decisions like, do I buy extra equipment? Do I buy extra potions? Do I save on a separate file? Do I go grind some more levels because I barely made it out of that last fight alive? Like, it's a strategic game. It has tactics right in the title. So you could argue that you getting boxed into a position where you're like, oh, I can't, crap, we're out of potions, or my armor got broken, or my weapon got broken, yeah. and, and now I'm essentially trapped here, that that feels very on brand. But if it ruins the game, <laughs> and I now have to abandon my save file, you know what? I would yeah. rather have the video gamey freedom to back out of a sequence of story fights, go grind a little, and then come back, or yeah. do what a lot of modern RPGs do, where they're just like, oh, no, if we go down there, I yeah. don't know <laughs> if we're ever going to come back just out. lampshade it. <laughs> right? Yeah, just lampshade the ever-loving crap out of it, because <laughs> that at least doesn't wreck my 20-hour save file. Yeah, and there's definitely a few encounters in this game that threaten to do that. Even this playthrough, and I've played the game 10 times, uh, you know, after Reoven is castle, there's on the rooftop, there's this battle. I already complained to you privately before the episode, <laughs> but there's a level where it's one of those, you got to protect this person and they're a reckless idiot. <laughs> and there's only three opponents on this map and they are very fast. And so like, if you have the wrong class mix, you don't even get a chance to move before they've killed this person you're supposedly protecting. Yep. And that just is frustrating as hell. <laughs> and, you know, eventually, and, you know, you might say, well, school of hard knocks, you got to get creative, switch your classes, figure something out. And I did, but I didn't really feel great about that experience. It wasn't like through my ingenuity, it was like, Yo, know, like 20 times, there's like a long story chunk at the beginning where her brother dodges or takes the bullet for her. And like, it's just like, uh, I got a like unskippable cinematic, which is an unforgivable thing on replays. And uh, so <laughs> eventually I figured out, okay, I need speed. Even if I'm weak, I just need to be fast to even make this happen. So I made a bunch of ninjas that didn't have weapons. <laughs> <laughs> I I gave I had the martial arts skill from the monk so you know there's a there is a lens where you're like Mike you got creative and that's awesome but I I didn't like it <laughs> although I I will say uh before I I commiserate with you that that particular unskippable cutscene has one of my favorite animations in the entire game to the point where I was playing and Susan was behind me doing something else on the couch and uh, cuz I was sitting at her desk and I literally turn around and I was like, no, wait, 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 shut up, shut up. W watch this, watch this. This is amazing. <laughs> because you think when that scene starts, you're like, oh, I'm about to get introduced to like this, this new political church guy who's like a total bastard. And like, we're going to have to deal with him. And then this character you have never seen before, who has this super unique design comes onto the screen and grabs him by his throat <laughs> and lifts him up in the air and hurls him off of the top of the church. <laughs> yeah. And then he is never mentioned again. Like no one mourns his death or re remarks his passing. And I just love that animation so much. Cause he's like, he just shot the brother. Was it Rafa? No, Rafa's the sister. Yeah. Uh, Ray Ramark Rajing? <laughs> it's another R name. Uh, yeah, the guy, the church guy like just shoots the brother, and you're like, oh, he's he's the threat, and then the the lady just shows up and just murder houses him, and he's never Malik. mentioned again. Malik, that's it. Rafa and Malik. But I just I love that animation so much. So if you have to get stuck watching a cutscene, <laughs> that would not be the worst one in the game. Uh, the one that I got stuck on, where I literally like put my head in my hands and was like, I have lost save files at this part of the game before. <laughs> and I am about to happen. Have it happen again. Uh, is, uh, when you fight we Yeah. Because you have to fight him by yourself, where it's just we and Ramza. 
Oh, like on the other side of the castle wall? No, not... Uh, oh, before he transforms. Yeah, before he transforms. Yes. So you have like a one-on-one fight with him, and then... Uh, Part of the same castle dive yes. on, like series. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that one almost screwed me out of my uh, save file. And then the other one that almost screwed me was when you fight What's-His-Jerk, um, the evil version of Orlando there. <laughs> Yeah. The, the oh my god, I can't believe I can't think of his name. He's such he plays such a huge role in the first half of the game, and then never seen heard from again after uh, murder house. Gafgarian. Gafgarian. Like where you have to fight him one on one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the one on the other side of the wall where yes. he's like. Yeah. And he's got an attack that heals him every time he hits you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So th- that was like I ended up in both of those situations doing the exact same solution you did, which is like if I can just move first. <laughs> then like <laughs> even if i only have a 20 percent chance to hit i just have to keep reloading my save until i eventually land that hit and am able to progress through the story which yeah. is not a great game playing experience but so on my my most current playthrough of that one i i got sick of him healing himself all the way because he would occasionally get to go twice in a row or something i'm just like no <sighs> And uh, so I actually I had I added knight skills and I broke his sword <laughs> so he couldn't use his holy swordsman ability. See, and, and th- this is why. So this this is a larger mechanical question we need to dive into because um, didn't even occur to me that did not even occur to me. And I think it's because I didn't have a knight that could even do that because I had a very a party that was very skewed. I had ninja monks. That's yeah. we were not magic users. We we punched people to death with our fists of fury, and <laughs> that was how we rolled. And most of the fights that'll get you through, particularly because ninjas are so fast. But every once in a while, it's like all the enemies have ranged attacks and can move fast, right? So like, yeah, it's not a perfect solution. Or the map is laid out in a weird way like this, where it's not a perfect solution. So. I feel like the game wants you to find combinations of abilities that make you powerful. They don't really want you to just totally min-max. We're like, I'm really good at this, and I'm horrible at everything else. Yeah. And and I also feel like they are expecting you to check in on things like turn order a lot. And I don't do that. <laughs> I only do it before I cast a spell, which, you know, very conveniently you press the right arrow when you're on your spell and you'll see when in the order it'll happen. Um, Yeah. Did you ever do that? I I mean, I know it's there, but it's like, I'm just, I'm not. Just like, oh, it's going (laughs) to take six for this fire spell to go. Will that even hit him before he moves? Or is he going to move next to me and be like, hey, buddy, want to burn together? (laughs) (laughs) Which is one of my favorite ways to take out an enemy. And they're like, oh, I'm going to cast fire on you. And I'm like, but you didn't check to see if I could I'm, move before you I'm did that. Brother's got a hug. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like uh, it's like how Sherlock Holmes kills Moriarty. Like, he like, yeah. grabs him and they jump off of the, the waterfall together. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, a lot of the mechanics are they decided to make a complex game and give you a lot of options. And how well is that? managed and i'd say i mean i think for the large part it's managed very well it's why i keep coming back to this game why it's satisfying but there there are these paper cuts um you know i think it's not a noob friendly game so very famously <laughs> i had talked to you a little bit before the show that um the first time i played it even the troop placement screen which we have to talk about <laughs> <laughs> is uh I didn't realize, and the game makes no attempt to like walk you through, that you could add a whole bunch of players with this screen, that you could add you know, up to five. And um, Okay, I, I will make you feel better. Uh, I have actually heard this story from someone else. So I'm not the only one. Yes. Um, and, and I may have, because I played, the first time I played this, I, someone else was showing me the game. So there's a bunch of learn how the game works paper cuts I never knew about until this playthrough. And I was like, Jesus Christ, they just expect me to know all this. Yeah. And so, you know, the the game starts off, you know, the first battle, you only control Ramza. And, you know, it kind of lets everything else autoplay. And then the second battle, 
is the one where I got bit by this, where I was like, to, to date, the only experience I've had is controlling Ramza, and now apparently <laughs> I can place a bunch of non-important characters to help Ramza that they haven't introduced me to. They haven't told me <laughs> I can put them here. And, you know, I think there's a number on screen how many slots you have left, but it does, it does not pause and go, here's the number of slots you have, now add them. Yeah. And I also think the screen is really strange because it's... It's trying to pretend to be like, now carefully place your guys in a smart way with <laughs> no information whatsoever. <laughs> and also, some of the battles have story elements that are going to move your character to somewhere else anyway, so it doesn't even matter sometimes. Which, if you know that, you can cheat, because yeah. <laughs> you place Ramza in it in a faraway place where you don't care, because he's not going to be there. Yeah. And then that allows you to place other characters where you might have placed Ramza because now they're in like a, a more dominant space or in a space where they have similar abilities to Ramza or whatever. Like, Or, you know, summoners are about to try to hit all of you and you spread them out, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So there's it again, like if you want to make a devil's advocate argument, you could say like, yeah, your first time through, you wouldn't know those things. And then your second time through, it's as if you like you, a sc- you won't remember. <laughs> well, you won't. Yeah, you won't. But it's like, oh, it's as if a scout like gave you information, so you knew how to like approach this. And they even screw you with, on that in some ways because I noticed some of the random fights because the story fights are always exactly the same. Uh, one just quick side note: one design element that I absolutely applaud them for doing is random encounters. The enemies scale. Story encounters, they don't. So if you yeah. are a tactical moron and you do not make an effort to learn any of the game mechanics, you can just go level up to 99 and then just march through the story with squires like or chemists yeah. if you wanted to, right? You absolutely could do that. <laughs> so uh but but they um some of the random encounters, you don't always enter the map at the same place. So even if you're like, oh, I've fought in this desert dozens of times. It's like, yeah, but your characters may be coming from the north or the south or the east or the west, and then the enemies are randomly distributed. And you, like you saw, showed me what is probably the most extreme example of this I have ever (laughs) seen in my life. Uh, When I faced 11 monks. (laughs) Yes. So this is... uh, Okay, so uh, if anybody's listened to other episodes of Nostalgia Goggles, you know... Uh, we joke about the show notes sometimes because there's not really a lot in the show notes. Um, there's some stuff, but it's not like a super detailed list. Um, this is one of those times, one of those few precious moments. I am <laughs> actually going to put uh, Mike's terrible cell phone picture of his television screen <laughs> into the show notes because he actually had a random encounter with 11 monks in a line. All marching in <laughs> unison with their treadmill. It's just so <laughs> ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous enough that when you sent that to me, I because I was playing, I put the controller down and rolled over to where Susan was reading a book on the couch and was like, look, look at this nonsense. <laughs> it's It's... The game is just having fun. It's like, how about this? <laughs> this is insane. Yeah, that that's what makes me think they don't just screw you on the seed, and that it is true math being executed every time. Because I doubt that every playthrough has the one random encounter with the monks that fleed the temple before the persecution in China, and you just happen to run into all of them on their way to their new temple. <laughs> Well, and there's also the weird like collections where it's like six chocobos and one human that apparently is a feral child running with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like it's like three bombs, three black chocobos, and a single time mage. It's like what are you, what are you doing over there? Do they work for you? Like, were you also Saint just Francis out here wandering? Of Assisi. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> what were we even talking about? <laughs> ah, who- oh, the, the the whole like prep screen. So my problem <laughs> with this screen is the game pre- takes a lot of time to present it as like an interesting decision point, and I don't think it's really adding much value to the tactics of the game. And so I think there's no reason they couldn't just load the map and give you like let you see the map and place your guys like you're gonna go through this door or you know even if they want to preserve some mystery don't reveal where the enemies are going to be or the story element like they can they can still have some of that mystery but just generic like a little pattern of like a 10 by 3 like grid that you get to place on like well and some of them especially like if you do a lot of random encounters in the same areas 
you start to notice like, oh, I'm going to come in from the north side of the screen because there's an arbitrary place I can't position a character, and I know that's a big rock. So yeah. I don't want to put someone with a, a low movement behind that blank square because I know that that blank square is a big rock, and they're going to have to walk around it. They can't, like, jump over it or whatever. So there's... But, but those don't, like, when you have those moments of I've committed this useless piece of trivia to memory, <laughs> it doesn't feel triumphant. You're not like, yeah, I remembered yeah. that's where the rock is in this stage. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not triumphant. Yeah, it's not an interesting game scenario that you conquered. It's just like a so pointless you met, hoop to you, jump through. You mentioned the spell thing, and, and I'll, I'll admit I hardly ever actually confirm that my spells are going to connect. Maybe, maybe I just like the the not knowing and seeing what kind of crazy things can happen, but I, I do not check those charge time things. This playthrough was even more extreme because we were just, you know, ninja monks that don't have charge time for anything, so it didn't really matter. Um, maybe, actually, that might be it. I don't usually have a very magic-heavy play style, so maybe that's why I never built that muscle memory. But something I did notice, particularly because there's lots of magic using enemies and spell like abilities that monsters and stuff have, is uh, if it says there's like a charge time of eight, for example, like this spell will go off in eight things. It is, yeah. It's not eight turns, it's any eight things happening. Yeah. So you taking that action actually counts as one, right? And then if someone else was charging a spell and that spell now goes off. That's two. Like that counts as a thing that happened towards charge yeah. time, which really means if you're a heavy magic user, you should probably think to check the charge time list because if, if you are fighting a bunch of regular monsters, you can pretty much guess like, okay, four people are going to do four things between now and when this spell goes off. And I just moved all of my party, so I can pretty safely bet it's going to be them moving four yeah. times. But if you're fighting a bunch of magic users and a bunch of people are in the middle of charging things, who knows Like how many actual turns may happen yeah. between now and then. Like You could never... It'd be like counting cards in Blackjack. No one would ever keep all that information in their head, even though you technically no. could. So referencing that list is probably a skill that, if I acquired, would make me a lot more comfortable with like different styles of play. Yeah, and I mean, you, you're hitting on the, the charge time and the turn order thing, because that's one thing that separates this game from some of its predecessors, which I think of some of the front, or not front missions, some of the, that is a similar game, but I was thinking of a Fire Emblem, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, on Genesis, Shining Force is like a clear precursor to this style of game. Oh man, I forgot all about Shining Force. <laughs> well, you should do a nostalgic one. <laughs> but those games were very much your team is going and then you finish every single person, even the ones that you're not doing anything with. And then <laughs> their team is going and tactics very deliberately. And I'm sure the tactics ogre games were already like final fantasy tactics. It's not the first game to do this, but it was a deliberate choice to intermingle the events that it's not only more realistic for the universe that, yeah, it's not like, all right, all of you fire your muskets, and then we will fire <laughs> ours, and then we will compare numbers on who wins. Like, it's, it's very much intermingled, and that you're right. If you're only doing instant actions, things that happen now every time, you can pretty much ignore that and just go, oh, I guess it's his turn, then it's my turn, then it's his turn. But if you're doing these delayed things like spells you really bump into that mechanic very directly. And thankfully, when you're looking at your magic spells, though the game does not give you a tutorial to teach you this, you it's sort of like they they built the tools you need to do access the information you want pretty efficiently, but they take no responsibility to teach you how to use it. No, And that's sort of my biggest beef with the game that doesn't affect me anymore because I know the game, but is an absolute barrier to new players. Well, and you, you mentioned like, oh, in that first battle, you just control Ramza. And then in the second battle, they don't really tell you. Now you have to add other people that you're going to be responsible for controlling. So I just thought the game was so hard. Like, <laughs> that, that fight was like impossible. <laughs> so after that would be funny if they were just like, nah, man, if you can't do it, then you're not tactical enough. <laughs> you and Delita <laughs> against like eight people. Against go. the world. Um, you're locked in here with me. <laughs> 
But ooh, that, no, that'd be too tonally different. No, but what I was going to say is uh, the game almost rubs in your face how unhelpful they're going to be because you have to win those two battles before the game goes, oh, hey, in this menu, you are literally now just getting access to for the first time. So even if this is your second playthrough, you couldn't have gotten to this menu any faster than this. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's where all the tutorials are. Everything you could need to know about the game, it's it's in there in a bajillion D different little menus and, and pre-rendered little yeah. cutscenes and things. And it's just like, I can't, I cannot recall. Like I said, I was introduced to this game by somebody who'd already played it a bunch, which gave me the friend advantage. But I know I'm not the kind of person who would have been like, aha, I will read every one of these menus and then I will understand all the game mechanics. Like... I hate to say it, but that actually might have kept me from playing this. If I didn't have yeah. someone to be like, oh, this is how this game mechanic works, like I could imagine have I could imagine having been completely turned off by how complex it is and by how little effort the game makes to tell you how to play the game. Yeah. And you know, just to catch myself, I I, I just looked up the instruction manual, which I feel like on some of the nostalgia goggles episodes, I'm kinda like, oh, like they actually provide a little walkthrough in the instruction manual that carries you through the beginning of the game. But I also know that people don't want to read anything when they play <laughs> games. And you, it's not really a fair answer to be like, go read this book first. Particularly for, not by this time in history. It's not like game yeah. design was a new field in 1998. Like They knew what they were doing by now. And I'm 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 just scrolling through a PDF copy of the instruction manual, and it does not walk you through in an experiential way. It's just like, here's all the buttons, here's all the jobs, <laughs> here's all the things that happen in the game, and buy our strategy guide. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and so it's you know, and this by the time you get to the PlayStation area, the instruction booklets kind of start thinning out and being a little more like, oh, we don't even print them in color anymore. Like, wow, well, <laughs> who cares? And like, <laughs> here's an ad for Bushido Blade. Okay. <laughs> Oh, man, and so made. to I mean it's not the worst instruction manual I've ever seen and I mean you guys don't usually make it a point of even commenting on those things which is fine because it's really about playing the game um, but the game also in game you know you finish that second battle and you go to the world map which it barely explains and then it's like oh yeah you know there's like there's some clean towels over there whatever you figure it out well, as long as you're living here <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, it's um I don't know. It it's it's um it's a design choice I disagree with to be that unhelpful to the player, but the information's all there. It's just not conveyed in a way that's immediately obvious or helpful. Like it's it's not new player friendly, right? Yeah. Once you know how to play the game, the game itself is very fairly balanced. You have nearly perfect information. Nothing ever happens that's totally BS and is against you, the player. Like, there's a couple times there's a guest in the, the party that does something that's totally BS, but it's in favor of you. So it feels like cool. Like, oh, this person's on my, like, o Olin or whatever, like, has galaxy yeah. stop that just is super magic in a world that already has magic. Like, Th those kinds of things are are neat, but because they're in favor of the player, they don't feel cheap, right? But yeah. to be so new player hostile is just, I, I just disagree with that design choice. Yeah, and you, you know, it's 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 easy to just hand a, like in most of other Squares games, especially the, the more recent you get, they'll do that more like, almost like computer software tutorial level, like onboarding. And then they just have a skip button. If you're like, you know what? I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I got it. Don't bother. Like, it's it's easy to add that so that the, the veteran doesn't have to sit through it. Um, and this game just doesn't really try very hard. And it's it's fine. Just <laughs> hunker down. If you're a new player, you just got to sink, sink in and, and learn it. But, um, you know, I, th I think really the heart of this game and the other, like, big mechanic area I'd want to talk about is the job system as a whole. Which yeah, we, this we, game, we can't, if we discuss the whole game and we don't talk about the job system, that people are going to question whether or not we actually played it. <laughs> and, um, I'm, again, I'm not super familiar with Tactics Go Ogre, though I understand it probably has a lot of these similar mechanics, but, you know, the, the closest analog was Final Fantasy V had a job system, and that mm -hmm. was famously the one they didn't put out in the U.S. until some bad load time PlayStation <laughs> version came out. 
and or or if you had a way to emulate it. But um, this obviously deepened that dramatically. And uh, you know, in this game, uh, your characters aren't really born to be. Oh, I'm a I'm a mage. I'm an archer. I'm a lancer. I'm a, like. Every single character can kind of be molded into whatever you want them to be. And they, they do have, like, the brave and the faith core attributes that kind of define some of their potential a little bit, but it's not really a big deal. Like, you can turn anyone into a magic user and go to town with oh, them. Oh, yeah. And and also, one of the things that's significant about this job system compared to the job system in Final Fantasy V and even some other Final Fantasy games that came later is... Uh, normally it's like, oh, I need a white mage in my party for this fight, so I'm going to make you into a white mage so you can do white mage things. In Final Fantasy Tactics, you can give someone who is not a white mage the secondary ability of white magic. So if the thing you want from that white mage is a spell they already know, not for them to get better at white maging, then you can leave someone with their primary responsibility and then give them the secondary power of whatever that other class's yeah. primary power is. And then you can also do, uh, I don't know what the actual name for these things are, but like a responsibility. Like, what do you do when someone attacks you or uses magic on you? You have yeah. a passive ability, and then you have like a movement ability. And you being able to mix and match those from different uh, jobs lets you do crazy things like give a ninja plus two jump, which makes them like a terrifying specter that can show up anywhere at any time and is kind of (laughs) awesome, right? And like you can take the... Or ignore height even. (laughs) Oh God, that one's the best. Because then it's just like, aha, I'm up here on top of this building. So am I. (laughs) There is that one map with like the really tall building and you're just like, I'm just jumping straight up there, buddy. Oh God. And it's, you know, because teleport fails so often, it's just not as satisfying. Whereas ignore height always works and always looks hilarious when you do it. <laughs> so it really is the heart of the game, and that's where most of your drive to to grind out anything or get new abilities, like that's kind of the hamster wheel of the game that keeps you going, is you're like, oh, I just found out I could become a thief, and thieves have move plus two. I want move plus two now. <laughs> and so that, that drives your player satisfaction and your, your motivation um, probably more, I mean, the story is good. Like, I think it's a pretty good story for this era. And, and in general, like, you know, it's got some hilarious, silly, especially the third act kind of like, <laughs> it's like Game of Thrones. And then at the end, it's like, yeah, oh, demons. <laughs> <laughs> also demons. It, it kind of, it kind of just turns into, yeah, there has to be a big bad demon thing at the end, I guess. But like for most of it, it's a different kind of story, but really the, the meat and potatoes of the game is that play like they totally nail the satisfaction of player progression and that's what i mostly come to an rpg for is i want to start out simple and very satisfyingly become powerful yeah it's it's you you because they're your avatar and you want to like grow them into an impossible magic wielding height ignoring you know, behemoth that <laughs> enters the fray and and the battle is over after you've taken your six consecutive turns because you're so much faster than everybody else, right? It's like, you, you wouldn't want to start with that. That'd be boring. But crafting the path that leads there is satisfying. Uh, a question I have for you about that path. Um, when you are a white mage, you, sorry, when you're a priest, because we have to talk about the translations at, le- at <laughs> oh, least yeah. briefly, when you're a priest and you uh, are gaining <laughs> job points in priestliness, um, that that makes sense, right? When you're a squire, you're gaining job points in squireliness. At some point, and I swear to God, it's not true early in the game, but at some point later in the game, you earn job points in jobs you are not currently being or even have any yeah. support abilities currently pulled from. Why is that? How are the what literally I am asking you, do you know <laughs> how that happens? Because I do so, not understand the method by which that happens. It does seem like sometimes new jobs show up and you already have points in them. But the one mechanic I am aware of is if you are playing alongside people of another class, you earn one fourth of the job points they earn in their class. So if Ramza is a knight and there's four chemists doing chemist things, and they don't even have to do chemist actions. They just are chemists doing things. 
Ramza will earn chemist points as like splash, sort of like splash experience from them being chemists. But I don't know about like totally unrelated job classes, why you would get points from them. Maybe, uh, I don't think you get anything from enemies doing things. So, okay, so there is a weird splash effect in your party. So now that may have filled in the gap because what I'm thinking is like, if I am a ninja, but I have the martial arts passive ability equipped, I'll bet I still earn some amount of monk JP, right? Not from your own actions. Only if there's an, a monk in your party doing monk things. That's my understanding. So if I or just a monk doing anything, but so if I have like other support abilities equipped, I don't get some splash into those. Your job points go to your primary job. Is my understanding, no matter what. <laughs> I, I hate to say it. I'm, I'm not going to do it right now because I think it'd be boring to watch me read through a bunch of forums, but I'm I'm going to actually have to look this up because this was something that as a kid, I was always like, huh, I wonder why I suddenly have a bunch of JP in this other job class for whatever. Yeah. Now I can unlock this ability. I don't feel like I earned. That's neat. <laughs> but on this playthrough, because I was you know critiquing the mechanics so much harder, there were a couple times where I was just like, why? Why? Why is this happening? Why am I suddenly better at these things? <laughs> and did, did you feel like even in the classes you never intended to max out, like mediator or one of the other like random ones that like you don't even care to use that if yeah. you have job points you feel like spending them because you just hate seeing them sitting there yeah so this <laughs> is um this is something uh, i wanted to at least give a quick mention to we don't we don't have to tease this apart a lot but i do think it's a funny story um i really wanted to finish the game before we recorded and i've beaten this game a um, million times before so it's, i didn't need to do that i just i like this game i wanted to see the end of the story because i enjoy the story quite a bit uh <laughs> i was rushing a little bit in the end of chapter three and i plowed through chapter four so hard that when i got to uh the final series of battles i was about 15 levels behind the cpu which is a lot of levels <laughs> to be behind the cpu yeah and so I did something I actually don't think I've done in any other Nostalgia Goggles games. I cheated. I, <laughs> I used the item duplication glitch to have a party kitted out with double Excaliburs. So, so I just had this army of knights plus Mustadio with uh, double Excaliburs <laughs> just because the Excalibur hastes you. And so yeah. we always went first. And so <laughs> given enough, you know, praying to the gods of statistics, we could enter a fight we had no business winning and win that fight because all of the last battles, you only have to kill one specific story yeah. person to proceed. So we would just descend on one poor face <laughs> character and beat them to death with our unfairly gained Excaliburs. <laughs> I think there might technically be a way. I can't remember if you can get multiple Excaliburs, but there is like a deepest dungeon where you truly get them when you're earning them. <laughs> uh, like I is, thought the Excalibur was a truly unique weapon. Maybe that. Is. There there are some like final weapons that you get from like the deepest dungeon things I never bother yeah, with same. where <laughs> they're, they come from a random enemy that can appear as you keep replaying it so that you can... I think it's... It's like a ninja in them will throw one of them at you, and if you have the catch mm, ability, yeah. you can collect multiples you of might, them. You might be right. And I know there's also, in the main game, just which is a common RPG trope, that there are some items that can only be stolen off of face characters, and that is your one yeah. and only opportunity to do it, right? Um, so that's true. maybe I could have legitimately earned seven Excaliburs, but I that's what I'm I trying didn't. to say is maybe maybe <laughs> it's not technically impossible. You could have ended up with this party, but you, obviously you weren't earning. <laughs> You're just like, eh, no. and, give me. and even so, I mean, I still barely squeaked out a win. But when I did, uh, it felt really hilarious because it's all these super <laughs> powerful monsters. And then we would just descend on the one story character and just be like, chop, 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 chop. This battle is complete. <laughs> Uh, um, so, uh, uh, oh, no, you, you go right ahead, sir. 
there is a game system that I read about recently that I was totally oblivious to for the past 21 years, Uh which is the fact that your Zodiac sign on each character affects how well they are compatible with each other or enemies. Did you know anything about this? Um, I knew that it had an in-world impact, which is why they make you tell them when your birthday is and why they constantly remind you what the date is. The date is shown on the overworld map and on the save screen every single time. And so, but at no point in the game do they pause and go, look, here's a Libra and here's a Pisces. Like, Oh, no. And also, I mean, <laughs> again, I'm sure it's in that tutorial menu. And they tell you thematically that this is going to be involved because all of the dark super magic that you are railing against is Zodiac themed. So yeah. so there's like a thematic constant reminder, like maybe you should care what day it is. Maybe, <laughs> remember the first thing we made you do was tell us your birthday. Remember that. But, <laughs> but at no point in the game do they... <laughs> hint that it impacts your actual battle performance that like oh no. you curing this person is gonna go much better or you're more likely to hit this guy because of how your zodiac signs match up yeah. i mean they don't and, even tell you that brave and faith which are also constantly displayed on screen have a huge impact on how likely you are to hit how hard you hit how much magic impacts you certain abilities are impacted by speed which isn't communicated in any way unless you just happen to yeah. notice it <laughs> so it's just you know piles of more stuff to put in the category of the information is there and they tr- they make no effort to yeah. make you aware and, of it. And I will say as a side note, this is actually a thing I prefer about video games to tabletop gaming is you can play Final Fantasy Tactics and have a good time and be successful and not really understand everything that's happening because that's true. because you can't make an impossible move, right? So if you make a stupid move because you didn't realize it was the Ides of March or something like that, (laughs) and then that makes it harder for you to win the fight, you can still go on to win the fight. You can't make illegal moves. You can't do anything that breaks the rules. You can't move too far because you didn't understand how the movement math worked or anything like that. Trying to play this on the tabletop would force you to have to either become an expert in the rules or be constantly referencing them every single time you were going to take any action or the enemies yeah. took any action, which sounds horrible, right? Whereas in a video <laughs> game, like is, if the game is designed well and it's balanced well, you can just flat out ignore or not even know about some of these mechanics and still slog your way through the game. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's definitely nice that it doesn't, it's not crucial that you understand them to even function in the game. <laughs> um, wandering dot to dot for a random battle sucks. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I'm sort of getting into like my, my random stuff. Is there any other like mechanic focused things you want to? No, I, I have one uh, story that I need to make an absolute point to uh, share with you before we uh, go into that final all consuming segment. Um, but I think. I think mechanically, like if you're going to put a TLDR on the mechanics for the game, it's they're super complicated and you will probably enjoy it if you dive into them the amount you want to dive into them, right? Like don't don't feel obligated to learn how every single thing works, but you also can't be in total ignorance to where you'd send Ramza alone <laughs> into a battle, right? Like, yeah, but you need some base yeah, level. Yeah, you need but. some base level, but they, they go way deeper than the amount you need to be successful. Because even if you never changed anyone from their first class, the game tops out at about level 55 for the big bad and the surrounding big bads. So if you get your people all the way up to like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, like, yeah, you could just plow through with squires and chemists. You absolutely could. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, so we didn't talk much about like shopping, but it's wonderful in this game because it's got a it's got a fitting room concept, which I don't remember seeing before this game in any of Square's games. But uh, the game has a very wonderful giant ladder of after every couple story events, there's a whole new set of gear for almost every class. And that also drives your urge. Like Earning new abilities is one thing, but also getting that nice new set of armor and that nice new sword that hits harder also makes you want to go out and fight and earn and um 
you know, they they keep they've dialed it in pretty well where it's not like it's not like I feel like some of the early Dragon Warrior games on the NES were like for the next 15 hours, if you want to afford that better sword, <laughs> you got to go fight slimes forever. Yep. And it's not like that. It's like, oh, go go fight a couple rounds, and you'll be able to equip a couple of your people with the whole new set. And um, well, that to drive that, they give you a fitting room, and the UI, just like the rest of the game, has a ton of information, and they communicate it very clearly where what will this sword do or, you know, whatever. You do the fitting room, and you can actually just do... It's sort of like Final Fantasy VI's optimum, but for buying new stuff, not just equipping what you already have. And so it makes shopping really quick if you don't care. Like, just give me the good stuff. I don't um, care about my but, accessory, even though they super, super matter. Yeah. Do you want to move extra? Or do you want magic defense <laughs> or whatever? Um, yeah, you got to dial in and do the try. actually try things on if you want to set your accessory. And so the one hilarious... Uh, time i feel like it almost has to be a joke in the game is the stupid sea bags and pea bags yes. that end up being the best fit it is is it's that like this i hope it's a joke this <laughs> screw you joke i have no idea what is supposed to be happening there and the, when you i actually never buy them i you know in the last 10 playthroughs but like when you use them don't they like spend your gold like when you hit I, I don't. I, I I feel. I feel. I like remember it's checking a coin on bag them once literally... in the early two thousands, and then being like, "Oh, these suck," and never touching it again. So, if you've never played this game, basically, they give you this wonderful tool that you know a, a tailor picks out just the right outfit for you, except for he, you know, these certain shops decide to upsell a giant, expensive handbag to your female characters, yeah. and it's like, this is the best weapon we sell. How about you use this? Yeah, I never, I honestly, the way I always thought of it was this weapon has some game mechanic involved I don't understand and do not care to understand. <laughs> I would vastly prefer it if it's just a joke. If it's just their way yeah. of being like, oh, ha ha, you sent her into battle with a purse. Har, right? Like, because that's not a very good joke, but at least then I would understand it. If there is some insane battle mechanic behind it that actually like if only you unlock this arcane magic it would make the pea bag the most powerful <laughs> weapon in the game that would actually annoy me a lot more <laughs> so they yeah I, I choose to believe that they just like they gave you this really handy tool for shopping and they decided to make sure you're paying attention every once in a while like just kidding well and and to your point about like wandering square to square or dot to dot so that you can get into a random encounter. Something they do that I think very minimally inspires exploration in a world that never really feels like it has to be explored. Like you're just moving through the story is different kinds of areas sell different kinds of stuff. So like if you have a, a party full of knights and you happen to be at like the magic city and you yeah. want to know if there's new swords, you have to go to a place that would sell stuff that knights would care about, right? So not yeah. only does that encourage you to explore a little bit, but that makes it more likely that you're going to hit some random encounters, which will help level you up a little bit, which will make you less likely to be way underpowered when you get to the next story fight, right? <laughs> and hopefully you didn't just change into a class and have no equipment for them on your way to that place. <laughs> I have done that before. <laughs> um, but yeah, so th there are some like, there are some things that the game does in its design elements that make it feel like you're su you're they're trying to guide you into doing things that are going to set you up for success. But there's so many other design elements that they're like, figure it out, moron, that it's hard for me to say for sure that that's what they were doing because they don't seem yeah. to really care about my feelings. <laughs> no. Uh, blame yourself or God. That's what the game says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one other thing we talked about, uh, and then I, I am fresh out of mechanics notes um, from from my notes is uh, the the like the bar where you can like hear rumors and like that's how you access side quests. That really feels like a layer they added to the game where they they said uh, we want to make the option for side quests, not just something you can complete the game without engaging in something you could realistically complete the game without ever knowing was an option. And yeah, 
I have mixed feelings about that, right? It's kind of weird to be like, hey, there's all this bonus content, some of which is actually really interesting and unlocks interesting extra items or or whole other face characters you can add to your party. And uh, yeah. if you don't explicitly go looking for them, we're not even going to tell you that they're there. Like, you need to go and seek them out. And some of them are downright freaking cryptic. Yeah. I, it, like, it's neat that all that extra content is there, but maybe a hint... That, like, that's a thing I should possibly pursue at some point, and then I can choose yeah. to pursue it or not. And they definitely carry that through in Final Fantasy XII. There's a job board at every bar, and you get side quests through it the same yeah. way. But it, that game definitely tutorials you like crazy, yeah, so you, you actually know about it. So um, Yeah, there there is a whole lot of, like, there's... And there's also just downright secret stuff that, unless you read a guide, like... Some of the like deep dungeon things you gotta go through, like secret tiles you land on with move find that take you to a new level of it, and the game just mm-hmm. just like maybe you'll hear about it. Someone will find it and they'll tell you about yeah. it. And Which actually, th- this is a good segue into the last uh, real mechanics thing we could discuss a little bit is um, the translations in this game are terrible. Like they're really shockingly unbelievably terrible to the point where sometimes words are just flat out misspelled their punctuation is wrong yeah i mean this isn't just like oh ha ha they didn't translate it the way a native english speaker would have done it it's like they didn't translate it the way someone who knows any english would have done it like it's they (laughs) they paid someone in china whose second language is korean to translate this into english and it's just from japanese like it's 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 really not good and The reason I I think it's worth mentioning at this point is in War of the Lions, which I think I only played through a couple times, um, where the translations have all been cleaned up uh, because that's, you know, the the PSP remake. um, I bet some of these things are less horrifically obscure, where if you talk to the guy at the bar, he doesn't say, you know, like, oh, I heard about a dungeon one time. And you're like, is that it? Right? Like... (laughs) <laughs> he probably gives you something that maybe is still cryptic, but at least it's all of the pieces of the puzzle as opposed to several pieces from different puzzles <laughs> that don't fit together in any coherent way. Um, I don't disagree that the original release has a pretty hilariously bad translation <laughs> at times. I'm not sure I like the War of the Lions translation much better because I it's definitely more professional <laughs> but it's also way more flowery. It, it's and a lot of it just forsuits. Feels like and... I'm way more at arm's length from it, and I actually kind of don't enjoy that either. So <sighs> I wish I could have a good, <laughs> more approachable translation. <laughs> yeah, I, I only played War of the Lines, I think, once or twice. My favorite thing about it is that one of the like extra secret characters they added was Balthier, who is yeah. from Final Fantasy XII, which is set in the same, you know, aesthetic universe as... He's like a Mustadio kind of character. Yeah, but he's, like, way more powerful. Like, <laughs> he he's the one thing I miss from not playing the War of the Lions version because that had just some horrible flaws. Um, I have my, my last story that I want to share with you, uh, and then, you know, anything else you have is fine, but th- I just want to make sure. Um, you uh, messaged me in our chat while we were playing through this, and you alluded to when you know a character is about to leave your party and betray you (laughs) that it is fun to strip them naked because now in that next fight they're going to betray you but they're naked and it it (laughs) makes dealing with them a lot more hilarious including no abilities (laughs) so exactly that right so the stripping naked thing is pretty much like an end into itself like it's worth doing because it's just funny um (laughs) When uh, I got to the battle where Algus betrays you, I hate him so much. <laughs> He's just... And George loves George him. George loves him, which is <laughs> shocking, really. But, I mean, I guess, you know, he's into that kind of noble hierarchy society thing, that class system. Um, it's really, it's a shame. He seems like such a nice guy. Anyway, uh, Algus is terrible. And the way he talks about other human beings is so reprehensible that when I got to the fight where he leaves you, I actually hit the reset button on the PlayStation so that I could reload, not only strip him naked, but change him to a class he had no abilities in and that would make his stats worse. 
and remove all of his support abilities so that the very first thing that could happen in that fight is I would go first, I could turn to him and murder him in one blow just so I could be done with him because I hate him so much. (laughs) That was a real Thanos move, just like changing his entire existence into something he can't fight you. (laughs) Pretty much. It's just, it's, it's one of those those beautiful moments where I'm super aware that I'm playing a video game because I'm like, Oh, I'm going to hit the reset button and do all of these like video gamey things to cheat the story. But it is in Pac-Man style. Like you go so far off the right edge of the screen, you come back into deep immersion. Like I was exploiting the mechanics so hard because I was so immersed in the story. Like I feel so much vitriol toward this character that I am supposed to feel vitriol towards that. I was actually pretty okay with the fact that I was exploiting the game mechanics to be more immersed in the story. Like that's a rare and beautiful kind of moment. So as, as, as a game we've both played like basically throughout our adult lives as one of the you know, short list of games you revisit every so often, um, has your way of playing through it changed over time? Um, and more specifically, do you keep a big roster in your army or are you like, here's the five Navy SEALs I'm running through this game with and I, I ain't got no time for anyone else? <laughs> uh, so my play style has... My awareness of the roads not taken has gotten a lot broader. Like my peripheral vision is a lot sharper because when I was a kid and I was first figuring my way out through this, I found a solution that exploited certain game mechanics in a way that jived with my play style. And then I I rode that all the way to victory, right? (laughs) And then on subsequent playthroughs, I started to notice more and more like, oh, these other things would probably complement each other really well. But I kind of already have a solution to this problem that I'm still okay with, right? And so I didn't vary up my play style too dramatically. I think now, like, if I wasn't playing through this on a schedule, like, where I knew we had to record, I think I probably would have enjoyed mixing it up a little more and trying some, like, totally foreign for me play styles. Um, As far as my roster goes... uh, Five dancers. (laughs) Just calculators all the way down. Um... (laughs) It's my my roster is uh, I when I play this game apparently I'm really prone to celebrity because I will abandon a character I've lovingly invested time in for a, a powerful <laughs> face character like at the drop of a hat like the second okay so in the fight where I knew I was about to get Mustadio a face character was about or a non face character was about to turn into a crystal and I let them go. <laughs> because I knew I was never going to use that so person like, again anyway. No, you don't even want their armor and weapons yeah, I was just, to I was just like, whatever, they're dead to me. <laughs> so, so I just let them, let them die. So not only do I not keep a very deep roster, but I actually have a slightly deeper roster than I should because I will keep face characters I'm never going to play because I just want them <laughs> to be... I want them in my... like I'm, I'm like... Uh, was it, who is it like Truman Capote? Like I just want celebrities around me. So like I feel more famous. <laughs> so like, like I have Malik and Rafa in my roster right now, even though they uh, have never no seen way. a single battle. <laughs> so and once I have my core, like Ramza and the four, you know, nameless people <laughs> Your superstars. that I'm going to run around with forever. I I fire everyone else. I, I strip them naked the second they join a party. And I go, hit the road, man. We don't need you. And then the only exception I make, the only face character that earns a slot is Orlando because he's so freaking overpowered and I can't resist it because he, he's going to come holy explosion everyone the rest of the game. Well, the fact that he has a night sword and I think he's the only character you can get that has night sword which is the one Gafgarian has that hurts them. A, a, a Grius has it too? No, she doesn't, she doesn't get a sword. Oh, okay. Oh, not that particular ability. She has the some of the other She ones, has Holy but... Explosion. She has all the ones that like break armor and weapons and stuff, which are still super useful. But for some reason, she is slow as butts. 
She, <laughs> yeah. she, yeah, I fire her pretty immediately. She always goes last, but I really like her character, so I always keep her around because I like. <laughs> I want when well, they give you the, like the saddest going away <laughs> message, like I thought we were working together on something beautiful, <laughs> and you're just like, nope, get out of here. <laughs> no, you thought wrong. Even the <laughs> monsters, because you can you can get monsters in your party, which is kind of a cool mechanic, but like. Even the monsters, when you fire them, it puts their sad going away message in parentheses, like you're reading <laughs> the emotions off their face because they can't speak. You're white fanging them. <laughs> no, yellers, my chocobo. I'll do it, ma. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's hard, man. It's hard to say goodbye. <laughs> not anymore. This at this point, maybe my first couple playthroughs, but now I just don't. I'm, so thick skin, just like get out of here. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Leave your sword. <laughs> leave your leave your stuff. I can use that. Now go. Don't need you. Yeah. No, it's I, I I'm I respect how you live your life that way, because that's what's essentially what I'm doing is I'm just letting them die in obscurity. <laughs> At least you free them from their servitude. <laughs> Not even letting them go live their life. You're like, I might use you, but I won't. Hey, who knows? Maybe at the last minute, I'll be like, only Rafa could win this battle, who is still 40 well, like, levels below the last boss. And it's true, the face characters often have a class that's unique, or even if it's mostly the same as a normal class, they'll have a few extra abilities in it. But I don't really like, I, by the time I get to most of the good ones, I've invested so deeply into like my characters can use all the items and they all have throw item if I need to throw it on their ability list or, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Like they, they, they're a deeper character. So I'm not going to like grind new characters. Like, uh, you're giving me like soft clay, but I've already got what I need <laughs> over here. No, it's, it, I, I'm, I'm just enough in love with because I mean Orlando's Orlando, everybody Orlando. If you don't Orlando, it's because you. <laughs> well, and I stop grinding anything once I have him, oh, yeah. other than the last few abilities I want him to have, and I'm just like, whatever. The game is easy mode now. Yeah. And That's the weird thing about this game is it starts out pretty hard. Like some of the early battles, if you don't grind a bit, it just like slaps you in the face, like. Hope you're ready for magic and range attacks because you're at door to trade city. <laughs> like, yeah, it, and, it really then, does like, have like but, a reverse difficulty curve. Like it, it gets easier. Yeah, and unless you don't want to grind at all, then it'll stay hard. But, it, unless you yeah. don't want to grind at all, or you absolutely do not have the disposition for this game style. Like it, if you just do not understand. How to like? I'm not going to heal anyone ever. Like, I'm yeah. just going to swing through. Or, it. Yeah, or like I'm always going to charge in so that my first round is wasted getting close enough for them to hit me on their first round. <laughs> like, yeah. if if that's how you play, then yeah, you, you would probably not be very successful. But the game, generally speaking, kind of gets easier as you go on because your characters start to get powerful enough as you combine different abilities and you learn how they work that you stop screwing things up the way you did in the first couple of fights when you had no choice and which gives you less of a reason to go grinding because you're like well i'm 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 like by chat by middle of chapter four you're kind of like hitting this stride of like i can pretty much handle anything yeah well and, and, and chapter four is so much more story dense than the earlier chapters that at that point they're kind of just like okay you're you're seeing you the, have what you need. Yeah, you're, figure it you're out. seeing the story through to the end now. Like this, this is it. We're in the home stretch. Um, and speaking of the home stretch, uh, we're, we, <laughs> we've kind of not been super secretive about <laughs> how we feel about the game. But um, for you, <laughs> did you feel like Final Fantasy Tactics held up? Absolutely. It's a uh, you know it belongs in a short list of games like Super Metroid and Link to the Past and a few other Golden Era Square RPGs where. I revisit this game not every year, but probably every other year. Like there's a there's a certain cycle to when I feel ready to play through it again, and it's it's pretty often. And so for especially for a game that is you know a good playthrough is twenty to thirty hours unless you're really trying to blaze through it. And there's not a lot of games that long that I still play. Yeah, I have noticed that my replay of lengthy experiences unfortunately has gone down as I've gotten older and I have kids and I've got a job and I just, there's other crap I want to do with my free time. Right. It's like, 
I would love to replay my favorite, like Final Fantasy VI, like one of the greatest RPGs ever made. Like, would I love to pour 50 hours into that two or three times a year, every single year for the rest of my life? Yes, but I can't <laughs> honestly look at all of the things that I have available to me to do and prioritize that as a thing I do that frequently, right? But Final Fantasy Tactics is... If you go through at a pretty decent pace, I think you could keep it under 20 hours pretty reasonably and not be like super stressed out. And if you want to drag it out to where you're all super powered demigods who get eight turns before anybody else gets to move, like <laughs> you can stretch the experience out to 30, 40, 50 hours, right? And, and get, unlock every little thing. And that's that's a nice range to have where it's like, I can feel good replaying this because I can do it in 15 hours, and I, yeah. if I'm really into it and I happen to have a bunch of free time, then I can stretch it out and get more enjoyment out of the replay. Yeah. Is there any more modern game in this genre that you feel has like replaced it or even threatened to replace it? Like, do you play Disgaea? Do you play any of the other like so this is, grid-based isometric yeah. turn? Th- this is where game? Tactics holds not only a special place in my heart, but it apparently brutally murders anyone who tries to even like visit that place in my heart (laughs) because I tried to play tactics ogre and I was just like, no, I'm playing these in the wrong order. I should have played this first. (laughs) Right. Like, and and it just didn't work. Um, and then I didn't learn about, uh, Disgaea until years later. And I think the first one I tried to play was like the third one in the series because there's a ton of them. And, like, they've remade a couple of them now because now the series has been running for so long. And I tried to play uh, Final Fantasy Tactics Advanced, and I was just like, no, this doesn't feel Mm. quite right. (laughs) Like, it's because it's wearing the clothes of my former lover, but it's not. And it just, (laughs) I'm like, can you not wear the exact same thing they used to wear? This feels weird. You're making it weird. Yeah. So, so like, I I couldn't get into those games. I, I, I couldn't really get into the Disgaea games. Like, Tactics Ogre was, like, too too early right like it didn't have some of the polish that i needed um and every time every time i've heard about another new one i'm like or i could just replay final fantasy tactics which i still enjoy until this year uh you and one or two other people that i know actually recommended checking out um oh god what's it called uh the it's like bug alien monsters into the breach into the breach so i have not yet tried into the breach but i wanted to replay final fantasy tactics for this episode because the last time i played it was actually a few years ago like it it's i'm busy enough now that my yeah. s- replay cycle stretched out and so i replayed this i still super duper enjoyed it and so i'm like oh maybe in, maybe into the breach will be the one we can talk after the show about that one. No. I'm going to say <laughs> no. It's not going to replace no. it, but it's it's a good game. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, nothing has quite scratched the particular itch that this game scratches as well. I like other strategy games. I like Fire Emblem games are fun. I like Advance War, but they're just different, and they're they're not quite as... I don't know. I don't feel like I can sink in as much into the the good version of the hamster wheel of just like, I just want to, I want to earn everything and I want to upgrade everything. Yeah. No, I mean that, and that's, I think it's fine to like for me, cause this, this feels a little less true for you, but like for me, I may not love this genre. I may just love this game. Yeah. And that's, that's fine. Like full, full on, like, for me, this yeah. game needs no nostalgia goggles. I will probably replay this a dozen more times or more over the course of my life, and I'm totally fine with that. But it's like one of the questions George always likes to ask is like, would I recommend this game as being a good one in this genre? And for me, I would say uh, play this game because this game is beautiful and wonderful. Don't play this game just because you love strategy games. Like, if you love strategy games, you will probably also love this. But even if you don't love strategy games, this one is just so damn good. Yeah. And I, yeah, it's one of those games where every time they re release it on a new platform, I basically hand over more money. <laughs> Except the mobile versions suck. Don't even bother with the touchscreen version. Yeah. I got it on Super Sale, but it. It's you know what it's it's uh, the mobile versions are the algus of remakes of this game. <laughs> yep, get it for PSP if you want it portable. 
or hopefully they give it on Switch. Come on, Square. Oh my God, that's just money <laughs> that you can have from me whenever you want. <laughs> the curtain falls. The music plays. The credits roll. Then it all fades to black, and you're left by yourself. The fanfare is gone. There's no player two there by your side to share victories won. But as you slowly progress down the hall to your bed, a few great events leak back into your head. From the time that you spent traversing the land. Battling evil, fighting the darkness, just sword in hand. Your memories creep in with the end of a smile. <laughs>